beginning to look a lot like last year. Every game I watch. What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Blazers Uprise post game show presented by BetUS and Manta Sleep Mask. Today, the Blazers lose in Atlanta to the Hawks 120 to 106. But despite the loss, impressive performances from a couple of Blazers, most notably Delano Banton and Tamani Kamara. We're going to talk about them. Was this Banton's best game of his career? Let me know in the chat if you think so, because this was a very impressive performance from him. We're also going to unveil our latest big boards today. 1 through 30. I got Eric's 1 through 30. I got my 1 through 30. And we're going to talk about a couple of prospects, especially with March Madness underway. And uh, Sweet 16 is tomorrow. Later on in this uh, stream, we'll pick a few Sweet 16 spreads via BetUS. And if you want to get in on the Sweet 16, make sure to use that BetUS link at the top of the description box below to sign up for BetUS. It helps out the channel. And then if you use promo code JOIN125, you get three 125% deposit bonuses up to 2500 If you deposit 100 they'll give you $125. That's 125%. Shout out to BetUS for sponsoring the stream. We got Eric in here. And this game was uh, was something, man. I mean, multiple Blazers struggled. Scoot Henderson had an awful first half in his homecoming. Luckily cleaned it up a little bit in the second half. Um, you had a, uh, a team that shot the ball well, the Blazers did. 
Uh, 45% from three is phenomenal for this unit, and over 50% from the field. You would think they would be able to put up more than 106 on the board, but when you only get to the line 10 times and only make six of those free throws, only get six offensive rebounds, and turn over the ball 18 times, you're, uh, it doesn't really matter if you shoot the ball too well because uh, you're giving it up a little too much. You're not getting to the line. You're not getting second chances. And that was basically the difference in this game because shooting-wise, the Blazers were on par with Atlanta, but they got to the free throw line a lot more. 20 times, made 16 of those free throws. A couple less turnovers. They turned over the ball 16 times. That's how they were able to put 120 up on the board. But uh, some impressive performances, Eric, from a few young Blazers, which was good to see. Uh, what are your thoughts on this game? And uh, I guess we'll start off with Delano Banton and your thoughts on him. Yeah, Banton was uh, really good tonight, obviously scoring 31. Um, thought he did a really nice job at times of making the, the right pass. Um, which is something we've been asking for him to do. Um, he does have still several moments. I mean, on a tanking team, this doesn't really matter. But he does have – he'll make a shot, and all of a sudden it's like heat check mode. <laughs> like, you know, you know he's going to yeah. shoot the next couple times he touches the ball. Like I said, it's fine right now. It's just, you know, in the framework of a team next year that – is hoping to maybe do some things. Um, you can't really be doing that if you're a if you're a quality rotation player. But yeah, other than that, it's uh, it's hard to complain about anything he did. He's shooting the three well. He's dunking on fools. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, just been really impressive, uh, especially tonight. Yeah, most complete game from him. Uh, when he has hot scoring nights, I've wanted to see him pass the ball a little bit more. He uh, still got up shots, still put up 23 shots, but he was efficient. Mm -hmm. And he made the right pass more often than he has in some of his previous high-scoring performances. And that's all you can ask from him. Uh, that's what I've been asking for from him. Because he's showcasing that he can score the ball. And I think he can be efficient when he just makes the right play. And I think tonight is a perfect example of that. You know, he had a, he had a lob to Wreath earlier in this game that I thought um, signified how he played tonight. Where he drives, two people rotate over to him. And instead of trying to force up a layup on a double team, he lobs it across to Wreath who uh, gets an alley-oop lay-in uh, near the end of the second quarter. And that's the type of play where... Uh, Banton, when he's been drawing multiple defenders, he's been forcing up shots on his drives and, and not making the simple play. And his uh, efficiency has suffered from it. Uh, he's been shooting the ball poorly from two because of it in some games. And then, I mean, it's just not the right play. And he has guys that are open. And he's six foot nine. He can make a number of passes. And, you know, he'll have flashes where he showcases that he can see the floor, too. I think he's fully capable of it. And tonight, you saw those flashes pan out. You saw him with uh, with a number of assists there in the third quarter, uh, pushing the ball up in transition. I think he's a guy that's uh, key behind getting a little bit more pace behind this Blazer team because he can be a threat in transition. Um, and he's shown a little bit of a willingness to push the ball at times. And really happy with how complete this game was for him because – you know, I've been I've been satisfied with his scoring. I've been impressed with his three point shooting. I didn't expect him to shoot so well. And tonight, uh, five for eleven from three. Start five for nine. Missed a couple shots there late, but five for eleven from three. You'll take that from him. It's just been the efficiency from two, being able to to actually drive and finish more shots, and then just make the right play. And it's interesting, Eric, because you know he's he is doing this for a tanking Blazers team, but it looks like something that is sustainable as long as he makes the right decisions, mm -hmm. as long as he um, makes the right pass. Hopefully, that three point shot remains at the level it's it's been at because that obviously would be the one question mark going into next year. But I think the the thing I'm thinking about with him when I watch him is does he look the same way? with a much better team around him where he's more of a complimentary piece and how many shots does he take? Is he able to get the same offensive rhythm on less shots? There's, I think questions about how effective he is on a, on a serious team compared to a team that's tanking in March, but uh, phenomenal stuff right now for sure. 
Yeah, it'll be, that's why it'll be interesting to see if they do bring Sharp back, which it looks like they're going to play him the last few games of the season, or at least a couple games before the season's over. Um, if there's a game from here until the end of the season where Scoot, Sharp, and Anthony all play, um, like how does Banton fit into that? I, I'd be watching to see what he does. Um, your graphic actually says nine rebounds, but it was nine assists he had tonight. Yeah, uh, nine assists. Yeah, but uh, so I didn't want to shortchange him there. But um, I think that's the key to me is it's not necessarily being a team player when you're passing the ball in those situations. It's that your efficiency will improve because you're you're taking less bad shots and you're forcing less shots and you're getting quality shots for others. Uh, so the offensive efficiency as a whole improves because he's so good at getting into that area. Um, and then uh, his efficiency from two will jump up too. And if you can combine that with even somewhat mid-respectable three-point shooting, like in the mid-30 percentile, then uh, you have the qual- a really quality player on a really cheap contract next year. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how the rotation shakes out, but I mean, like, there's no way the Blazers keep Malcolm Brogdon, right? We said that going into the deadline, but now it's like you got a backup 6'9 guard who actually provides a little something different at that position. And it's, Is he a mentor, though, Tori? Is he a mentor, though? Do we need mentorship? Did, did Banton need mem- – I mean, Banton's doing pretty good with no mentorship right now. But Scoot well, is struggling. No. So I don't you, really know the equation there and how that all you, balances out. You don't understand, Tori. It's because he was on teams like Toronto and – in Boston with no mentorship, and then he came here and has Malcolm Brogdon, and that's why he's playing good. Phenomenal troll job. <laughs> right? Um, Malcolm's the reason Banton's good, right? Something like that. Something like that. Shout good out to thing Coach we didn't Malcolm. trade him. Um, right now, real quick, side note, and this is important for the tank race, the Rockets are down one in OKC with 33 seconds left. Maybe I'll do some live commentary for the end of this because this matters in terms of the Warriors pick. The Warriors won today. If they lost today with a Houston win, their pick actually would have went from 13 to 12. So with the Warriors win, the Rockets are trying to come back um, from this deficit in the final 30 seconds so that uh, they can remain a half game back of Golden State. If the Rockets lose this game, they will be one and a half games back of Golden State. They're taking on the Thunder in OKC right now. Unfortunately, it's Thunderball, but with four and a half on the shot clock. Giddy going to inbound to, I believe, Kendrick Williams with an insane fadeaway. It's an air ball. Amen Thompson kicks it to Jalen Green. He's going to drive, kick out. Wide open three for Jabari Smith is good, Eric. Go, so Jabari. Rockets are up two. Be interesting Hor- to see. Hornets won tonight. Yeah, Hornets won tonight. The Thunder don't call a timeout. They're going to have Jalen Williams drive and miss the layup, and he thought he got fouled. Thunder players are pissed, and they have, they have to foul. So Rockets up two, nine seconds left, heading to the free throw line for two free throws. So it looks like this could be, you know, outside of the Warriors win. A pretty good tank day for the Blazers with the Hornets winning, and the Blazers are only one win away from them. The Hornets finally won when the Blazers lost. And, I mean, this is a bad Hawks team that the Blazers just got blown out against. There's a decent chance the Blazers might not win another game the rest of the year. Uh, So, Blazers have a legitimate chance to move up to fourth. And if the Rockets can pull out this game, the Warriors pick still has a legitimate chance to move up to 12th. We'll take a look at the tank race later. Uh, Unfortunately, they have a Men Thompson at the line and he missed the first free throw, Eric. Sorry, he's got the second one. Yeah, we'll see if you got the good old announcer's jinx here. But 11 games today, phenomenal action there. And I'm going to update this headline. A man, second free throw. You did not jinx him, Eric. It's good. Oh, no, I had confidence in my guy. <laughs> Your guy? That's my guy. <laughs> <laughs> I was teasing. No, I've always liked a man. That's, uh, that's the funny part is uh, we had those Brandon Miller versus the men discussions but i like a man too it's not like i didn't like him as a prospect i like him more sure okay i'll, I'll give you that um yeah jonathan ever says spurs winning too that's not out of the question 
Because they've been winning games, man. Yeah. They beat the Suns without Wemby. So interesting stuff here. Blazers, do they really have a chance at? Well, they'd only be two games in the win column behind us if they yeah. win this, right? Yeah. We probably so, do sure. have to win or lose every game the rest of the year, but. Yeah. I mean, I could see him going like three and seven and us going one and one and nine or something. Josh Giddy in this game hit a shot where he was sitting on the floor in the, <laughs> in the paint. That's crazy. I saw he tried to help Jabari Smith up, and Dylan Brooks, like, shoved him out of the way. Man, Dylan Brooks is too extra sometimes. Like, that scuffle they got in when DeRozan just decked whoever it was, that's when you want a teammate, a veteran teammate, standing up for a young guy. But too often, it's just too too much from Dylan Brooks, man. Why are you shoving a dude for trying to, trying to help a dude up? That's good sportsmanship. Why are you shoving I don't get it. I don't get it. So, and, Thund- go ahead. In terms of the Warriors, uh, I don't know how many. Someone in chat probably knows Thunder, this. Thunder inbound, uh, nine seconds left, and then we'll touch upon that. They get it into J Dub, and they intentionally foul. So, what were you saying? There? Oh, uh, Draymond got two technicals and was ejected. Um, I don't know where he stands in terms of technical fouls, but that might be another suspension. Um, he also had a questionable uh, thing where he kind of took a swing slash push someone on Patty Mills, in, yeah, in their last game. So, um, yeah, <clears throat> that was the foul to give for Houston. They're going to inbound it to J Dub. He's going to get up a pull up three and hit it. Oh. With four point oh. seven remaining, Houston does have two timeouts, and they're going to call one of them. So they got a chance. Tie game, 4.7 on the clock. J Dub, big time three. We need a Jabari Smith game winner like against us in Summer League. Oh, I would love that. I would love that. Jabari Smith just hit a clutch three. I got the graphic updated. Cool. Um, so timeout here. Only reason we're commentating this game is because it's relevant for the Warriors pick that the Blazers are getting. From the Warriors, unfortunately, OKC hits that shot. Houston, right now, a game behind Golden State. If they win, they're only a half game. If they lose, they're a game and a half. So hopefully Houston can come through here and hit a game winner to extend their winning streak to 10. Kind of crazy talking about the Rockets, Eric, having a potentially 10-game winning streak. And this would be an impressive win on the road in OKC. Um, I don't know what the injury situation is there because i don't see any sga or chet on the floor at that final possession so are they all are they both out sga was out of this game chet left the game i don't know if he fouled out or got hurt or what but he he left uh oh fouled out yeah yeah i know he played but he left the game in the fourth quarter fouled out with nine minutes left um and this game is also uh, kind of fascinating from OKC's perspective. We got the inbound here in a second. Uh, Jalen Green to inbound. He's going to get it in top of the key to Jabari Smith. Gets it back. Turns the corner. Driving right. Up at the rim. Layup is off. There was a lot of contact. Looked like it could have been a block or a charge. They didn't call anything. And the layup was halfway down and rimmed off, Eric. So we're going to overtime. Yeah. In OKC. All righty. So, time to recap the Blazer game. And Real if this quick. game is close with like a minute left, then we can we can call them to it. But go ahead. OKC is in a little bit of a situation where they might not want to see the Warriors, like if they got the number one uh, seed. Uh, and so they might want Houston to pass the Warriors because I don't think any of those teams up top want the Warriors to make the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. But also, it's like, if you're the number one team in the West, you shouldn't be afraid of anybody. No, you shouldn't be, but... it was it, See, like, ever since ever since 2019, Eric, because you remember, mm-hmm. in 2019, there was yeah. a lot of Blazer fans that were pissed that the Blazers had that, like, 25-point comeback led by Amferty Simons and Scala Bissier and Gary Trent Jr., mm-hmm. uh, you know... Ants and Trent's uh, rookie year because if the Blazers lost that game they would have faced the Utah Jazz who had played the Blazers well like the 
previous two years. And if they won, they were going to play, play the Thunder. So a lot of people were rooting for a loss in that game. And I didn't agree with that. I wanted OKC because I didn't believe Russell Westbrook could uh, uh, was a good postseason player, as we saw pan out. But but so we win that game. A lot of Blazer fans were mad about that. And I was saying, like, we're the three seed. We should not be scared between playing Utah and OKC. They're both good, solid teams. But if we're legitimate, then we're we can't be scared to face OKC. And I... And then what happened in the playoffs? We win in five games. We beat them in five games. Yeah. Dame dominates them. And ever since then, I'm like, you know what? If you're if you're a team with home court advantage, you should not worry too much about who you're gonna face in the first round. Um, I'd rather I'd rather face Golden State if I'm OKC because you gotta believe you can beat them and will beat them, and then have that home court advantage all the way through the Western Conference. But that's just how I look at things with teams. Well, they'd have if they were number one, they'd have a yeah home court no matter what. Yeah, I'm a big fan. Um, It with OKC in OKC situation or the Blazers situation you talked about. I don't like like messing with karma at all in those situations. I feel like anytime you kind of lose on purpose or try to get a matchup you want, it doesn't really work out well for you. Yeah. Uh, speaking matchups, we want Blazers Hawks. <laughs> <laughs> um, Banton, phenomenal game, complete game. He's just on a roll. He's playing with a different level of confidence. He's getting an opportunity and he's flourishing with it. It's just it's going to be different when he's not playing on a tanking team. I, Eric, at this point, I assume he's going to have a rotation spot next year. Uh, Rockets three out of the. OT break. That's great. Um, I assume Banton's going to have a rotation spot. I don't really know who plays and who doesn't play because you got the three guards. You got Banton and Kamara as the threes right now. And then you got Jeremy Grant at the four and, uh, you know, backup four. We're, we still have a draft pick at the top of the draft. And then centers, you got Aiton, Williams, Reith. Like, the odd man out this offseason, in my opinion, is obviously obviously uh matisse liable shout out to dylan brooks i was just hating on him and he just splashed a three so rock us up six um hate does wonders just like aiden explained on that one <laughs> post game show um but matisse liable is obviously the odd man out with the way banton's playing right yeah well draft picks too <laughs> that could factor in yeah i mean the problem is, if you draft a three, I could see that that small forward not playing at the start of the next year. If it's like a Cody Williams, Eric, mm-hmm. Banton is kind of like Cody Williams, in a way. Yeah, if he shoots a three. Yeah. Um, Banton, with the way Banton's playing right now, I would expect him going into next season to get minutes over Cody Williams, even if we draft him at, you know, three, four, whatever. You got Kamara playing great, and then you got the three guards. How does that shake out minutes-wise? Obviously, you get Brogdon out of here, but you don't even got playing time for Thibel. It's almost like you have your point guard, shooting guard, small forward position set because it always makes sense to have five players playing those three positions unless you got somebody playing both the three and the four. And those five players right now, to me, seem like Simons. Sharp, Scoot, Kamara, and Banton. That's what I expect going into next year with the way Banton's playing right now. I expect him to be that fifth guy. Yeah, I'm really hoping that they see the light and trade Jeremy. (laughs) (laughs) I doubt it, but... Do you... Would you be okay with playing Kamara or Banton at a power forward spot? I'm fine with Kamara. I don't like playing Banton. I think playing him at either forward position kind of takes away a little bit of his advantage with the size. Yeah. Uh, like I know he's big enough to play that position, but the whole point is having that size as a guard is an advantage. When you start playing forward more often, um, then you're not bigger than any uh, or most of your matchups. So. 
Um, but yeah, I, uh, I completely agree with what Jonathan Evers says in chat. This is exactly why they need to swing completely for upside. That's a hundred percent accurate because you don't need, it doesn't matter like if they don't figure it out right away next year. Right. Yeah. Uh, they need to hopefully hit on the best player eventually from that draft, even if it takes a couple years, not the guy who can help them win games next year or be a part of the rotation next year. It's okay to be patient. And as we're seeing with um, Taman, or uh, not Tamani, uh, Ryan Repair, who we'll talk about in a little bit, I mean, Tori, like, what if he's good enough to be, like, in in this conversation next year too? You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility with the, the flashes he's shown um, having a whole offseason to – work on some of the things he needs yeah. to work on and just some of the, the passing and instincts and, and length that he has. Um, I mean, this guy could factor in sooner than later as well. Yeah. I just, I don't, I don't think they have the minutes to go around no. now. We're all, the Blazers are always hurt. So I, I expect right. him to be kind of the sixth man in that equation, like the sixth point guard, shooting guard, small forward type perimeter player, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not taking into a like, you got six of those guys at those three positions that you could make a case could play next year potentially. Repair I think is the sixth best, but he's shown some good things in the games that he's been playing um, off season under his belt. I fully agree with you. He could be a guy that could factor in. That's six guys. That's not counting Thibault. That's not counting Brogdon. That's not counting if the Blazers use um, a lottery pick, one of their two, on somebody that can play the small forward spot. So. It's just interesting how that has shaken out in that way. Um, Banton is somebody that, I mean, he looks like a really good role player right now, and the Blazers traded nothing for him. That's why, in the Blazers' position, you A, don't draft for role players, and B, you don't trade first-round picks. You don't trade the Warriors' pick for a role player. Mm -hmm. Because you can... Find role players for cheaper, and especially in Portland's position, that's the beauty of a rebuild, is you have minutes to give to a guy like Banton and see if he can flourish, where Mm -hmm. he hasn't really shown a ton in previous stops, so you can get him really, really cheap, and then you get great return on value. Banton already looks like he's given the Blazers phenomenal return on value, given that they gave up the, what, the worst of two top 55 protected second round picks, and this dude is dropping 31 and 9. On 13 for 23 shooting, he has, what, five straight games of... Isn't it like five straight games of at least 20 points or something like that at this point? Let me look at his game log. He's just putting together a phenomenal stretch. So, that's why you got to swing for upside, and that's why it shouldn't be settling for trading a... Even if it's a late lottery pick and a questionable draft, they should not trade that pick for a role player. Because you can find role players right now. They got a complement of role players across this team that maybe aren't good enough role players to make this a winning team, but give it another year or so, give it another two years, I fully believe the Blazers won't have a problem in terms of some of their complementary pieces, especially seeing the way Kamara has played lately. Like he's reminded me more and more of Maurice Harkless, but I think he can be I think he can be better than Maurice Harkless, Eric. I think he can be a better shooter, a more consistent shooter. Um and then defensively, like, just he has some phenomenal moments on the defensive end. So, Maurice Harkless was a very key role player in a team that made a Western Conference Finals. The whole thing is who's going to be that star? Who's going to be that superstar? Who's going to be that leader? Hopefully, it's somebody on this roster. Might not be. The Blazers have to swing for that as much as possible to give themselves a good, of a, good enough chance to get a superstar. That is literally the whole thing with the rebuild. Now... If you accumulate assets, trade Jeremy Grant, Malcolm Brogdon for picks. Maybe in the future they have enough assets to trade for that superstar in case they can't draft one of them. That's why I'm in favor of taking a step back to put themselves in a position to either draft that star or uh, trade for that star in the future. Because in terms of some of the role players they got, I think they're going to be just fine. Um, Banton is the type of guy... If he's playing like this, I would have loved to have had him on a number of Damian Lillard-led teams. I would have loved to have Kamara on a number of Damian Lillard-led teams. And uh, 
it's it's phenomenal value. The Blazers got Kamara as kind of a throw in in the eight and trade. He was drafted with a pick in the fifties, and then Banton, the Blazers traded a top fifty five protected second. So, you know, it's kind of working around the fringes of a roster and finding a way to uh, get two big forwards that can probably play a role for a winning team going forward and that's something that Neil Olshay didn't do good enough in the past so really just these two guys especially Banton and Kamara are making me less and less worried about bench spots or, or role role players and more and more focused on how in the world does this team get its star of the future if it's not already on the roster yeah and worst case scenario Banton has more value right now than a top 55 protected second. So even if you don't have minutes for him and need to move him, whether that's this summer you decide, you know, you just don't have the minutes for him and, and want to move on or, uh, you know, sometime next year, um, I think it's, it's pretty obvious now you could at least get a second or two for him. Right. And so in just a few months, you, that's, that's how you become, a, a competent front office is you make trades like this and then get their value up and then sell when it's high um, or, you know, they're good enough to be part of your core. Um, so either way, I think it's it's really positive. And uh, I don't know. If, I'm not saying they will trade them or whatever or anything. Um, and then, yeah, I wanted to ask what anything we said has to do with us admitting we have no faith in Simons. I mean, that's just silly. Um, Simons, I don't have faith in him being the guy that can lead a team to a championship as the number one guy. But there's only like 10 to 15 guys in the league that are capable of that, right? Like, you got to be a top 10 to 15 player. Just because I don't think Simons will end up being a top 10 to 15 player in the league doesn't mean I have no faith in him. I think Simons could be good enough to be the number two on a team that contends. Um, if I'm being optimistic, if he's the number three, I think he's a phenomenal, phenomenal number three, phenomenal number three. So I'm not confident the Blazers have that future top 10 to 15 player on this roster. That doesn't mean the complete opposite that I have zero faith in Simons. Um, it's just, there's, there's number ones, there's number twos, there's number threes, there's complimentary role players, glue guys that fill certain roles that you need on the team, both offensively and defensively. I'm confident that this team is, is, has found some guys that can fill that last thing. Okay. It's just about finding that eventual top 10 to 15 player, that future superstar. Um, and when I say, you know, talking about hypothetically trading a Jeremy Grant or a Malcolm Brogdon for picks in order to trade for a star in the future. I don't mean this offseason or even next offseason. Ultimately, if the Blazers don't have that future top 10 to 15 player on their team right now, they're probably going to find out two to three years from now. They're probably going to have a good feeling for what Scoot's going to be, for what Sharp's going to be like two to three years from now. That's when you want to have enough assets where if you're not confident in those guys being a superstar, being a top 10 to 15 player, you can put assets in play to go find that guy. And then those guys can be a complimentary piece. Maybe you include one of them in the trade or so forth. You give yourselves the option. You kind of hedge your bets with some of the young players on this roster in terms of finding that superstar. But it's, you know, we had the superstar for years without good complimentary pieces, without a good enough number two, right? And... Now it's, uh, I think, a little bit different in terms of you can have some hope that some of these guys can uh, be complimentary. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, see, here's the thing. Okay. Every single championship team with maybe one or two exceptions in the history of the NBA has had, like, a a superstar basically, or a, a player that was one of the best players that season. Um, and so it's not, it's not a knock on Anthony Simons to say that if he's your best player, you either have to have multiple other hall of famers on your team, like the, the, the Detroit Pistons in 2004, or, you're probably not winning a championship, right? Um, so you, you'd have to have like the perfect lineup 
And even then, I'm not sure if that's the case. And uh, I, this is something we've always we've said all along. Uh, like, so I don't know why this is surprising. But um, yeah, it's just. But go back through all the champions. They all have pretty much a superstar on the team. Yeah. Um, okay, Taylor. Uh, <laughs> Jesus. So comment two, number two or number three that don't play defense. Well, usually won't work. Michael Porter trash can doesn't play any defense. He just won a championship as the number three. That dude doesn't play defense. People said Jokic doesn't play defense. People say Jamal Murray doesn't play defense. I think Jamal Murray's defense has gotten noticeably better since he came into the league. All three of those guys have had defensive questions during their career. They just won a freaking championship. Like, not every player has to be some phenomenal defensive piece. And Taylor says, well, there's a difference between what Ant is on defense and great, Tori. Bro, Ant is not so bad. And I don't think any player is so bad where if you had enough offense and defense around them and they was as good offensively as Ant is, that you're not going to be able to contend. Like, that's not a deal breaker. Taylor says, at least MPJ has real good length, but he's a small forward that can't move. He's a small forward that can't move. Like, we're talking about a guard here with Simons. I mean, come on. Like, it's... That's what the complimentary pieces are for. That's where you hope that, you know, and your number one is a two-way guy, right? But, I mean, so Milwaukee can't contend at all because dame you know defense this and that what are we saying it's just trying to discount what Ant can be to a winning team that's what other pieces are for Ant, i don't think is so bad that he's a deal breaker defensively i think that's an over exaggeration <clears throat> current scoot is probably a deal breaker defensively. <laughs> amphrey yeah. i think he at least is competent enough on that end that where if the defense was really good around him and the other players were really good on defense, I don't think it would be a, an issue. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it's it's all about complementary pieces. And this is where somebody like Kamara comes in. If you didn't have a Kamara for the long term, that's a role you have to fill. Guy with two-way potential, athlete, Big, can defend multiple positions, can defend guys at the point of attack. There was multiple times where an Atlanta Hawk tried to drive tonight, and Tamani Kamara just stonewalled them. Stonewalled them, Eric. He had a phenomenal block on Bruno Fernando, I think it was, that got called a foul, but I thought it was clean. I thought he got ball. Um, number of impressive defensive plays. He's starting to shoot the three ball consistently well, and he's starting to, like, finish a little bit more. And it reminds me of a rich man's Maurice Harkless. He had that baseline cut and dunk. Mm -hmm. We saw Maurice Harkless in the past make that cut all the time. And offensive rebounding. Maurice Harkless was a good offensive rebounder. That's something Tamani's been doing a lot of. Tamani has a potential to fill that role and then some. And that team did make a Western Conference Finals with a backcourt of Dame and CJ McCollum. Now, you don't want to have necessarily that. And Seth that Curry. Yeah, you don't want to necessarily have that undersized of a backcourt, but they were able to make a Western Conference final. So going forward, it's not necessarily that like one guy is the problem. If you have too many small guards playing at once that can't, you know, play defense at a high level, then yeah, you're gonna run into some issues that complementary pieces can't fully make up for. But if you're just talking about one guy, it's never one guy that makes or breaks a defense. Unless maybe you're, you're Wemby, but even with Wemby and how good he's been defensively this year, that San Antonio Spurs defense still sucks. So that's where you got to have the right pieces and you got to have cohesive pieces that fit to make up a team mm. and, you know, be able to throw out different lineups. I think Banton being a 6'9 guard that can handle, pass, create gives the Blazers... Uh, multiple lineup options with that because you can go big with him you can go small and have multiple ball handlers on the court if you play him at a forward spot if he's a guard that's a pretty big lineup because you got a six nine guard so you all of a sudden you have multiple lineups that you can put out there depending on the situation and that is an advantage to have especially in a playoff series when you're going to have to find ways to match up with certain styles of basketball and certain adjustments that the opposing team makes so the blazers are on their way to 
having a good collection of complementary pieces right now. It just comes down to finding that star. And if you find that star and you run it with Ant, right? Maybe Sharp becomes that star. Maybe Sharp becomes a top 10 player. And your backcourt of the future is Ant and Sharp, okay? If they got good defensive pieces around them and then that's struggling defensively and it's still not good enough defensively to win a championship, then you look at exploring, okay, what do we do now? Because mm-hmm. we've got a top 10 to 15 player that we feel like is good enough to lead us to a championship. Our offense is really, really good, but defensively we're lagging behind. And why is that? Okay, is it because Ant plus Sharp isn't good enough defensively? If Sharp's a top 10 to 15 player, then at that point, that's when you look to trade Ant for somebody that's more complimentary, I guess. If you feel like you can remain just as good or close to as good offensively and take a jump defensively. That's when you evaluate that. Sitting here, you know, a couple people in chat um, <clears throat> act like Simons is a deal breaker is, is just some of the Anthony Simons hate that I've talked about where people just want to doubt him and discredit him. And Taylor says, if you're going to have a small guard who is negative on D, you got to put the right piece around it. Okay, once again, we talked about this on a previous post game. If Anthony Simons is the point guard, he is not a small guard. He is normal point guard size. <laughs> like, like he is not small. He's only small if you're playing Scoot and Anthony together, um, which might be the case if they're completely locked into Scoot. And, um, you know, hopefully we're talking about a different Scoot. So this might be a different conversation. Um, you know, in a future year. Um, but if you have that lineup that Tori just talked about, it's not undersized having Ant as a point guard. And it's a lot easier to hide or make one guard, um, you know, not have to get hunted as much. It's a lot easier than having two guards get hunted the whole time. Yeah. And and so that that will probably have to be a decision at some point. But right now, if they had to make that decision this summer, I don't know how anyone can say they'd be confident choosing Scoot over Amphrey at this yeah. point. Um, and that has not, nothing to do with not being patient with Scoot or anything like that. But if we have to make that decision this summer, I think it's pretty easy. If we have to make it, if we have plenty of time, which we do, uh, you that'll work itself out in future years. And who cares if our defense isn't great in the next year or two? Yeah, absolutely. Talk a little bit about Kamara, his performance, seven for, seven for nine from the field, uh, shoots the ball well in this one, uh, three for four from behind the arc. His shot is looking real good right now. Yeah, and uh, we talked about this on the last show. Uh, we wanted to, or I wanted to see him grab the rebound and go a little bit more. He did that a couple times in this game, and um, so that that was good to to push the tempo and also to use that length on the the fast break. Um, but I love you talked about that baseline cut. Um, I love slashing Kamara like he yeah. he's. So good if he catches the ball like with a head of steam and an open lane to the basket. I wish he would just do it like every freaking play. But also his three point shots improve, so I don't mind if it's not there. Him, you know, fading back out to the free throw line and and getting or the three point line and and getting an outlet pass or a, a kick out pass there. Um, just uh, his shot looks great. His slashing looks good. His defense is good. There's not much to be upset with Kamara about right now. Yeah. Uh, this, he's kind of the guy that's, I mean, I guess you could say Banton, but the rookie we were hoping would break out during this tanking stretch was Scoot Henderson. And it instead, it's actually Tamani Kamara. We saw yeah. it last year, Shaden Sharp, right? He He <laughs> broke out, looked phenomenal during this tanking stretch and everybody's mm-hmm. just sitting there open scoot looks the same way of course but it's tamani man um last four games he has 11 16 12 and 17 okay during that stretch five for 11 from the field six for 11 from the field four for nine from the field seven for nine from the field doing it efficiently one for four from three two for four from three one for three from three three for four from three so during this four game stretch he is seven for um 
seven for 15 from three. And it's funny because we talked about how he had like a 20 game stretch where he was shooting um, something like 45% from three, if I recall correctly, somewhere in that range. And then he had a, he had a couple of games uh, earlier in March where he's, you know, over one for three, over one, one for three, one for five. And it's like, okay, is he going to regress back to struggling to shoot the ball? And since then, he is 8 for 15. Or yeah. 8 for 16. Um, yeah. So, f- phenomenal, man. I mean, this is the type of shooting we've been hoping for from other players on this team, at least with the consistency. And he's just been a consistent shooter. He shot 50% from three in February. He's shooting 40.6% from three in March. That's a pretty decent sample size. Like, we talked about Nasir Little a little bit last stream and how he was, like, inconsistent from month to month. Did Nasir Little ever have two straight months where he shot above 40% from three with some sort of volume? Right? Like, it's promising. It's a very promising sign the way he's shooting the ball right now because then it just makes the rest of his, his game easier offensively and then he can fit like a glue guy. Yep, uh, just very impressive. And this is something uh, I think you had the same narrative. Um, but my whole thing about this season was find out who your players are moving forward. And the more information you can find out, the better. And I think uh, Kamara has definitely solidified it him solidified himself over these over this last stretch to. Um, I think you can look at it next season that he's definitely part of the rotation and um, like a valuable rotation player moving forward um, starting next year. And yeah, that's and I, good that we know that already. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think there's a good chance that he could be the starting three uh, mm-hmm. once again next year. Um, he, If not, he's a very valuable piece off the bench. I mean, I guarantee you Phoenix wish they had him right now. Yeah. Who knows if he would have gotten enough playing time over the year to be playing like this at the end of the year. That's the thing. It's situationally based. But right. this is the type of guy, like, he could be getting minutes on a better team right now. With the defense, with the shooting, with... I mean, he's been flashing a little bit of playmaking recently. And that... Uh, the Playmaking, if he's creating for others, that's just extra. Like, that's just phenomenal. You don't expect a guy like him in his role... To be a to be a playmaker, to be a creator, right? Maurice Harkless was never that. So if he's providing a little bit of that, being able to play in the flow, put the ball on the floor, and just, and just like make the simple play, then then he fits in even better. Then he's an even better glue guy. Then he's a do it all type of guy, right? So, you know, I'm not putting any expectations in terms of him as a creator, but it does seem like he's getting a little bit more comfortable off the bounce. It does seem like he's seeing the game a little bit faster, which is a great sign. Yeah. So he earlier in the year. He pushed to that rookie wall, too. Yeah. Yeah, like, before February, you can make a case that he was just a just a complete negative offensively. Since then, I think he's been a complete positive. So, love Kamara, man. Love what he's providing. Love how hard he plays. Um, and he, he's definitely becoming more and more of a core piece of this rebuild, I think. Yeah. Matt says, to be honest, it was pretty clear he was better than any of our young forwards uh, all year. Um, yeah, and who said that before the season? Both Tori and I yeah. <laughs> said he was going to be the best of our young forwards. Yeah. We already knew that heading into the season. It's just nice that he's – I mean, we we needed him to shoot the three, and he's improved that. I think his, his shot looks better throughout the year. And, uh, you know, defensively, I don't think you could ask for much more from a rookie than he's given us this year. Um, short of being Wemby, you know, um, but yeah. So I, I don't, I don't know what point you're trying to make, Matt. But I mean, we've been on that train since the trade. Yeah, yeah, we've been saying it all all year, all Champ- year. Like the the two young guys I like, Eric, that I've said I like basically all year. Other than, you know, Sharp, Scoot, whatever. Like, in term, in terms of players that aren't guards, the two young guys I've liked all year, Kamara and Rupert. And that's because I like their physical tools. That's because I like their motor defensively. And they have defensive potential. 
Mm-hmm. And then they also both seem like they work their ass off. We hear about it with repair, right? Um, but they just they play the game the right way. Like they know how to play within the flow of the offense. And it's a little tougher when you're not shooting shots because then guys can leave you and then you catch the ball and, you know, you got to let it got to let it fly. Right. But those two have become the best shooters out of our young wing slash forwards. And the, you know, the four guys, it's Kamara, it's Repair, it's Shabari Walker, and it's Chris Murray. Those two guys are better shooters than Jabari Walker and Chris Murray right now. I feel very comfortable, very comfortable saying that. But a guy like Repair, let's kind of segue this to him. How many assists did he have tonight? Let me pull back up the box score. Repair in this game played 39 minutes. Didn't shoot the ball too well. Two for six, one for three from three. So a little bit of an inefficient night. He still needs to work on things driving to the rim. He still needs to get stronger. Like he has very clear cut things to work on to become a more efficient player, more efficient slasher, right? But he like moves decently. He just, he loses balance too much, right? And he may still be getting used to his body because apparently he grew within the past year. But in this game, Eric, uh, five assists, one turnover. And some of his assists are, are impressive passes it's not like he's making like super advanced reads but he sees the game quick he sees the game at an nba speed which didn't ex- didn't really expect that out of him like always knew he could pass and showed flashes like that but i thought the game would move too fast for him to make some of the plays he did tonight where he puts the ball on the floor and then the s- the split second the defense shifts he's immediately zipping the ball to the guy that they're shifting off of yeah. And that's just perfect play in the flow of an offense that moves the ball type of stuff. Mm-hmm. He he can handle a little bit. I mean, the, the playmaking stuff with him is a legitimate skill. A legitimate skill right now. He needs to get better uh, slashing to the rim. And then I still don't know how consistent of a three-point shooter he's going to be. Um, that has regressed a little bit since his shot shooting earlier in the season. But he's still shooting above 40% from three, which is great, right? It's just how can he become a better finisher, you know, get to the free throw line more, that type of stuff. But for where he's at, being only 19 years old, doesn't turn 20 until after the season, May 31st. The offensive stuff is further along than I thought. And he has a good complement of skills that he should be a guy that really fits in the flow of an offense and provides a lot of defensive value, much in the same way Ryan Repair does, or re- much in the same way Tamani Kamara does. Yeah, I, I will say, in terms of the game slowing down for him, I still think he's having issues knowing when the lane is there to attack and when to. Yeah pull back or pass so that's something he definitely needs to work on so i don't know if the game's completely slowed down for him in that he, regard yet he but. sees he sees the next pass quicker than <laughs> opportunities to attack right he yeah. he drives with the mindset to make the next pass but, but i'd rather have that than the opposite way exactly exactly because he i feel like he kind of knows his limitations mm-hmm. which a lot of young guys come into the league and they don't understand their limitations right and I think part of becoming a good role player is knowing who you are and knowing what you're good at, knowing what you're not good at, and being willing to do the things that you can provide a team to be a good role player. Because anybody can come in and find a way to chuck in, chuck up 20 shots if they're playing 40 minutes, right? Like, it's not hard to chuck up shots. If you're not a good enough scorer, you're going to go 5 for 20, right? But shooting the ball is in today's NBA is something that even a guy like repair, if he wanted to hunt shots could find a way in a game like this, where he plays 39 minutes to shoot the ball 15 to 20 times, but he shoots the ball six times. Half of them are threes. He goes two for six, gets the line once, and then just makes the next play, makes the right play. And that's key for a young player to embrace that. And he embraces that. And it seems like he knows his limitations a little bit. So he doesn't force things. And with how hard he works, I'm sure with him knowing what he needs to get better at, he's going to work his ass off on that. And that's what excites me about him. Absolutely. And yeah, to further that point, you know, we've seen him drive in and then have to take like a really tough, shot where he's like fading away or or but he can get those shots off because he's so long so he could shoot like 15 times if he wanted to especially playing 39 minutes um so i completely agree that it was nice to see him just play within the flow and do a good job of passing the ball because uh 
that's something that we've talked about with multiple players, uh, just making the right pass, making the right read. And the more players that do it, it just seems like the better, better it is for our long-term success. Yep. Absolutely. Um, speaking about other starters, Chris Murray was kind of invisible today. He did have four assists, no turnovers. So I'll give him credit for that. But 0 for one from three in 22 minutes, 0 for three from the field. Um, we have a donation about Chris Murray. Oh uh, yeah. Shout out to Christopher Aquino. Sorry if I messed up the name. $2 donation from Christopher says for Tori. I love the Chris Murray pick. Thank you. I love your donation more than I love the Chris Murray pick. So I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm disappointed <laughs> that Chris had a couple games where it looked like, okay, maybe he's finding a shot. And then since then offensively has just been basically nothing. Yeah, he had a couple of nice passes to drop to, in this game, so you like that. Um, only took one three. So to your point about not forcing shots, at least he didn't do that, even though he missed all three of his. Um, he didn't shoot a bunch like he could have or has done in previous games. Um, so, yeah, there were some good things from him, but, yeah, overall, you'd like your starter to play a little better than he did tonight. Yeah, he, he passes the ball quick um he had a nice pocket pass to wreath which was cool to see him run a pick and roll and throw a good pocket pass um i am getting a little a little tired of the drives where he like almost turns his back to the rim and just like basically is driving trying to find somebody just to give the ball to do you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah like a lot of times he drives, he's not even looking towards the rim. And it's not like, uh, okay, he's going to like look away from the rim, look off a defender to create a lane to attack. It's like uh, he looks like somebody that wants to get rid of the ball when he puts the ball on the floor a lot of times. Like, I want him to, to change the way he drives a little bit. He had a shot in this game where he... Uh, let, me, let me play back the clip so I can summarize it right. Where he like changed we did a cross like crossover between the legs didn't have a chance of beating bogdanovich off the dribble bogdanovich was kind of fading but like murray's not a not really a mid-range pull-up shooter so he drives into murray or drives into bogdanovich does a spin move does a little left-hand hook from like seven feet and it was kind of like that is part of my problem i feel like chris murray's gonna have against better defenses is if he's not shooting the three ball you can kind of back off him a little bit and he's not gonna be able to beat a lot of guys off the dribble this game you know he he made good in the flow plays good in the flow passes which is great and the day there's a couple times where it was like man he why didn't he shoot the ball right like is his confidence finally waning like it just didn't really make sense to me and he only shoots one three in 22 minutes that was kind of strange yeah kind of a forgettable game from him yeah um Still, you know, could be a uh, a rotation piece going forward. Maybe he's the backup for next year. He's going to have to improve that shot. Very simple. Yeah. I think he plays in Summer League probably, and it'll be interesting to see how he looks in Summer League. This next year's Summer League team should be interesting because you'd expect Repair to play. You'd expect Chris Murray to play. Shoot. There's a chance Scoot could play. Yeah, Maybe. Because Jabari Smith played some games last summer league, and he had a better Keegan Murray the third pick than Scoot has had. Jaden Ivey played. Yeah. So, and then whoever we draft, it could be a very fun time. Didn't Chet league. play too? I mean, know Chet was a rookie. Yeah. So. Um, well, I'm, he wasn't technically. He got injured and then. I mean, he played the summer league before, so it was. It was the second year of summer league. Yeah, yeah, still, you know, with it being him, he didn't play the year before. Yeah, but a lot of those second year second year guys are, let's just put it as, what, 2022 draft guys played. Or is that 2023 draft? That's 2023 draft. Um, so summer league could be interesting, could be fun. Um, <laughs> Raymond says, no sound. Why? Maybe un unmute unmute us unmute us raven um but 
let's talk about Scoot, and then we'll get into Bet US for a sec, and then we'll uh, get into other uh, other things, Tankathon, Big Board, that sort of stuff. I don't know if you saw it, Tori, but I do have a sharp update I want to read off here, too. Sure, let's do that now. What's the, what's okay. the update? I've not seen it. Uh, Trailblazers PR shortly after the game. Shaden Sharp has been recalled by the Portland Trailblazers. Sharp participated in non-contact and conditioning drills with the remix. He'll be evaluated over the next week as he joins the team on the current road trip. Yeah, so he could be back maybe April 3rd against Charlotte, which is a game the Blazers need to lose. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't like the idea of bringing him back. I do want to see him play, but yeah, I, I don't think it should be this year. Yeah, I feel like I feel like the people that want to bring him back, it's more so for their own reasons as a fan. Like, yeah. I don't want to call it selfish, but what's playing the final week of the season going to do for him? I, I don't know. The thing is, is watching Scoo makes me want to bring back Sharp a little less right now, Eric. Because I feel like Scoot isn't playing with quite the same burst and athleticism that he was before he missed time with that core strain. Yep. And I wonder if he's maybe maybe he's not hurting but maybe he's not 100%. Because, like, he missed... In the past couple of games, he's missed a couple of dunks. And for his first step just did not look like his normal first step today. Especially in the first half. He did pull it together in the second half. Was a little bit more uh, opportunistic. Um, didn't really force as much. But is it just me or does he seem to be a little less than 100% athletically right now? I mean, I don't know if he's – I mean, he's shown a couple of flashes of being that, but, I mean, we've talked all year, Chauncey has as well, about, like, where's this athleticism you're supposed to have? Um, so I think it's more – to me, it's hard to tell if it's just – he just hasn't shown it much this year See, or if it's really an injury. When he got, like, an open lane and could dunk the ball, he would dunk the ball, though. Yeah, but, like, his – he is kind of clumsy sometimes. So, like, um, the one tonight where he misses the dunk, like, he just, like, he mistimed his jump and, or, like, got caught, I think, between laying it in or dunking it or something. I don't know. But, um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I've necessarily seen a huge difference in, in athleticism because I don't think there's been, more than maybe 10 to 20 times this year where you've been like, okay, there's that athleticism, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's the only thing I, I worry about with rushing a guy like Sharp back is, I mean, I, it, they're not going to rush him back if he's probably not going to be at risk of re-injuring if they play him. Mm. I would like to trust them that much. Okay. There, Go ahead. There was a play last game where I thought it looked like Scoot. It was kind of early in last game. He was holding his groin area. Um, I forgot who it was that I mentioned that about earlier in the season, too. Um, but, like, it looked like he maybe was uh, not comfortable or something, but then he ended up playing the rest of the game. I don't know if uh, if he was just, at this point, just trying to, like, not show that he's injured or anything like maybe that's it he's just trying to tough it out and make it through the season which is probably bad if that's the case long term yeah. yeah i mean he needs to he needs to rest for like a month after the season i think uh, at least a month like that it can't be 90 percent. that has to get to 100 percent. and also it might be good for him after a tough rookie season to like reset mentally uh because here's the thing with him in terms of the way I evaluate him. Nothing that happens the rest of the year is going to make me any lower on him. Okay. 
Of course, we hope that he breaks out and looks like a star the final 10 games of the season because then all of a sudden we're going to be a lot more excited going into the offseason and headed into the future. And that's what we want to see, right? We want to see him look like a star. We want to see him look like the prospect we drafted him to be. But given this injury and given that he struggled his entire rookie season outside of a stretch right before he got injured, there's really nothing he can do to make me worry about him anymore. Um, and... A part of that is, given his struggles, I just want to see what he looks like after an offseason to work on what he's struggling on. And until I give him that chance, I'm not going to sit here and take every struggle if he struggles for a half and freak out about it. I just don't think that's super logical because he's had struggles this year. He obviously needs time to work on things. He needs an off season to work on things. Supposedly he has a really good work ethic. So at that point, every time he struggles, I'm just going to sit back and wait to give him the chance of an entire off season to work on things. Tori, if let's just say you're right. And that injury is causing a little bit of the issues were talking about right now would you preemptively just get the surgery as soon as the season's over or would you just try to rest up i'd get the surgery now yeah because i don't know how productive nba reps are going to be at this point when he's gotten minutes all year if he's not 100 percent, if he's 100 percent, i think the rest of the season could be good nba reps nba experience but if he's battling his own body right battling his own health on top of battling the struggles he's battled with all year i don't think he's going to grow from that that's where i'm just down to get it now call it a wrap for the season get back as soon as possible and if he get you know if he can then be healthy by i don't know june july and start working on stuff and drilling stuff and then maybe play summer league maybe summer leagues go for him and then july august september he can work on things i think that would be more beneficial than taking away that time to get him nba reps now if he's not 100 percent. yeah i am getting a little sick of like the well darren fox did this in his rookie year and so like that like I feel like we're putting, it's like, I don't know, like, we're setting it up to be like, he has to be the best case scenario, you know, and, uh, I mean, I think it's more so to get people to calm down when they freak out every time he struggles, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of people that freak out every time he struggles, like, he's going, he's going to continue to have struggles, like, mm -hmm. especially if he's not 100%, and, Give him an off season to work on things at least before we start coming to some of the conclusions that people are already coming to, right? I so I think that's the whole point about the deer and fox thing, right? After his rookie year, if he overreacted, we would have came to those same conclusions about him. So let's just pause, pump the brakes a little bit, and relax. Yeah. Do you um? Do you think, like, I mean, you've played with a lot of different types of players, not to, like, equate it to us or whatever, but, like, um, do you, if you have a teammate that you always have to, like, be reminding who they have or where to go on defense or like what defense you're in and all that kind of stuff while you're playing and having to work on, like focus on your game as well. Do you think it's like teachable for that person to learn? Or do you think it's just always something that's going to be kind of an issue with that type of player? Um, if, if you have to tell someone where to be as a teammate, is it possible for them to learn? I'm just saying, like, do you have confidence, like, like if you if you started playing with someone enough, do you do you feel like they eventually get better at that, or because in my experience, most of those type of players you play with them for like ten years, and te like 
year 10, you're still like having to tell them who they're guarding on defense and stuff. Like, yeah. But I mean, we're, we're talking about a pro here compared to, yeah, right. Like, I know. Like, <laughs> yeah. Some that's his job and he needs to work on it. Um, yeah, just, I, like, full, I fully think, cause you know, people criticize Dame for not knowing how to deal with a trap. And all of a sudden he learned how to deal with a trap. Like, I think there is a lot of things that, I mean, I assume this question is related to Scoot, right? Yeah. Well, before you answer, my it's more along the lines of can you be more than just a neutral defender if you don't have natural defensive instincts, I guess. I think you can learn how... I think defensive instincts is maybe over-exaggerated as a thing in general. Mm-hmm. Um... I think you can learn situational awareness, right? Um, Especially as you get more experience, get further into your career, you're going to see things faster. Because a a lot of it in the NBA is pattern recognition, right? At some point, you make the same rotation so many times that you're going to make it quicker. At some point, you're supposed to help in certain situations so many times you're going to help quicker. And you're going to help better, right? And at some point, you've seen, you've defended against a play that's been run so many times, you can start to anticipate it and anticipate what it's looking for, right? You defend horns so many times, you defend certain variations of horns so many times, you're going to start to recognize those variations quicker. And that's where somebody that as that as a rookie doesn't have good defensive instincts is what people would call it. I think some of it is they just haven't had enough experience to recognize things quick enough to look like they have good defensive instincts. Yeah. But that's why I got like Kamara who like recognizes things so quickly. He hasn't mm. seen this stuff. He's a rookie. That's when it's really impressive. But in terms of somebody that struggles as a rookie, I tend to give them a little bit of a pass because I think part of it is just gaining that experience being put in these situations over and over and over again where you're able to know what to do quicker and you're able to learn from mistakes, et cetera. Yeah. Well, so from my observations and I'm, I fully admit I am more focused on scoot on defense than anything else right now. (laughs) I I just, well, I want, I want to, I want to see what he's doing. Like I want to, I want to like, like I'm trying to get in his mindset, and so what I'm seeing is, well, I mean, besides the he got didn't get back on transition, let he was first one back and then still let someone get behind him, and didn't didn't get back all the way, but um, on a normal play when he's getting back, he does one of two things: he either just goes and finds his guy. It ignores anything else that's happening or he'll run to like the free throw line area and then try to find where his guy is. And then like a lot of times that it's too late. And so like, I just, I feel like it's just like, it's all like something he's like, obviously if it becomes the thing where he's not thinking about it, that's where the instincts come in. Um, it, it'll be fine. But I just, I feel like he just, like he gave up a three point shot because he literally just ran back. And instead of running to the, to the guy who was right next to him, he just ran into an area where there was no one and then turned around like to look for his guy or whatever. Who shot and that? Who shot that three? I think it was a DeJounte Murray one. Um, Early think, or late in the game? It was in the first half because the Hawks were going that way on the TV. Got you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to try and find the play that you're talking yeah. about. I think it was uh, I think it was maybe after Scoot missed his 3 um in the on on the top. Um and so Tyler James says Dame kind of does that too. So what Dame and we pointed this out last year like all last year what Dame was taught to do four years was to always just run back and guard the guy in the corner on defense. So he would always get just run back to the corner. Um, 
And so I think that's a little bit different. I mean, it's still not ideal, obviously, in a good defensive system. Um, but Dame too often tries to pass off guys with the ball when he should just pick up the ball. Right, right. So, but that's part of like you hide a guy for so long, and they're like, okay, well, somebody else needs to take the ball. It kind of cultivates that mindset. Yeah, that's that's a good way of explaining it. So, um, he's still looking for it. Yeah, I can't really find the play you're talking about. It wasn't after a missed three, and it was a made three. You said right. I don't. I don't remember if it was made or not. Um, <laughs> it might have been a missed one, but it was like a open three. He gave up. Yeah. Um, it was Dejounte Murray who shot it. Pretty sure. <laughs> he took eight threes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there was a play where Scoot was kind of the last defender running down the middle of the court. There was, like, somebody rim running in the middle of the court that he was shading over towards, and then they skipped it to Murray. But I don't think it was, like, a terrible contest, and it was a miss. Um, so I don't I don't know. I've looked at all Murray's threes. I can't find it. That's fine, though. Um, maybe it was this one. No, it wasn't that one either. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, um... I think this is reminding me of our drop coverage. <laughs> yeah. Like, Scoot, transition defense is rough. Uh, if he's still having this problem at the same with the same extent next year, then I think we got to worry about it. Mm -hmm. But that's just where you hope that he improves. Um, I think this team might have a little bit of a communication issue, though. Like, how often do you see guys, like, pointing in transition for somebody to pick up like a runner or somebody to pick up ball. Mm -hmm. I feel like this team doesn't talk enough. Yeah. And I, they talked about a little bit in the preseason. They got a lot of quiet guys, especially when you're playing with a lot of young guys. I do think that could be part of it, but he does seem to, to zone out a little bit defending in transition. And that's something that definitely needs to be fixed. Yeah. Anyone else you want to talk about from this team? I will say the the day they had Chris Murray mic'd up, I was impressed with just how often he was communicating. That might have been just because he was wearing a microphone that day. <laughs> but Mike all uh, him up. He he did talk a lot more than it seems like the communication is on TV. But yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, anybody else you want to talk about from this team? Not really. <laughs> you don't want to talk about Justin Manaya, Ashton Hagens, or Moses Brown? Not really. You don't want to talk about Moses Brown going one for five from the free throw line? <laughs> so, Baji played at the end. Yeah. He's obviously active. Yeah. Uh, so he's not hurt. Like, the he was active, but not really active, like Rupert a couple weeks ago. Yeah. All right. What? Why would you play Moses Brown over Ivy <laughs> Baji right now? Like, what are we doing? Doesn't make sense. Like, just like, get Baji Moses... some minutes and see if he can learn, you know? Like, Moses Brown is not going to be on this team next year. He better not be. Ibu right? Baji might be on a two-way next year. Maybe, yeah. I mean, I don't, maybe they aren't thinking he's going to be back either, but... <laughs> Still, though, like, there's... A, there's... There's a greater like there Moses Brown is not is not going to be back on this team next year. Ibu Baji maybe just yeah. for that alone, and Ibu Baji's younger. So you just play him. It's right. very simple. Like Moses Brown isn't giving you anything. Okay, he's three for five in twelve minutes, but dude's dude's a brick from the free throw line. I mean, it, his free throw might be the ugliest free throw form in the entire league. It's one, disgusting. One handed. It's it's awful. It's awful. So I don't understand it at all. I would love to see Baji play more. When he played, he had some good moments defensively. And I still feel like you can explore what you have there. Especially I think this team is moving the ball well. They had thirty five assists on forty three field goals 
Like, he's he's as much of a lob target as Moses Brown is. I feel like we didn't give that enough love. 35 assists on 43 field goals, Eric. I like the way this team is moving the ball, at least. Very nice tonight. Unfortunately. And, and it was everyone. It wasn't yeah. just, like, one person. Yeah. Unfortunately, they struggle taking care of it when they move the ball like this because they're young, but I'll live with that. I'll live with 18 turnovers if they're trying to move the ball, trying to play off each other, and they have a game like this where they have 35 assists. That might be the most assists we've had in a game all year long. It's got to be up there. It's got to be. There are 35 assists. There's games where we don't make 35 shots. Mm -hmm. So... Well, the other thing with Baji too, is there's actually been some games where he's, like, legitimately scared people around the rim and caused some wild shots or some misses or whatever, even without blocking it with his length. And I know Moses can do that a little bit, too. But, like, Baji's problem is he got foul happy a lot. Like, these minutes would help him maybe learn to not foul and go straight up and stuff like that. So, I don't, I don't know, man. But the passing was good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anyway. Tankathon. You want to do Tankathon first? I don't care. Okay. I, thought, I thought Tankathon would lead into the big boards, but I don't care either way. We'll do Think that people want the big boards. We'll take a couple questions, then we'll do Bet US, then we'll do Tankathon, then we'll do mm -hmm. Then we'll do um Big Boards. We got a lot to get to. Anyway, um take a couple questions first. Cause I gotta set that up real quick. Mad Mobile says Moses Brown is amazing free throw shooter. His follow through is completely. Uh, his, his hitch is wild, bro. Wild stuff. Alex Wolf says, "Would you consider trading down at all? Why? We have four picks. We have no. picks in multiple different ranges. If anything, we need to consolidate the picks, not to move up, not down. So no. What is the best flavor of Jolly Rancher?" That's quite the question. Mm. Um, I don't eat Jolly Ranchers. I'm not a Jolly Rancher guy. But you've had them, right? Yeah, I don't remember what any of them taste like. Mm. Yeah, Green Apple's good. I am I know a lot of people are going to think this is disgusting, but uh, I'm a grape guy. I like grapes. Grape gets too much hate. Grape anything gets too much hate. I don't understand yeah. it. Because like, grape Gatorade's pretty good. I feel mm. like people don't like grape Gatorade, though. I'm eating some right now. That's why I asked. I'm a blue Jolly Rancher man. Hmm. Interesting. Alex and Matt say green apple. Let's give Moses credit. He has improved his free throw shooting from 35% in college to 54% in the NBA. Hey, that's a 20% improvement. That's pretty good, Eric. Yeah. Good Jonathan job. Evers, I completely agree with that as well. <laughs> Said the banana Laffy Taffy gets way too much hate. I agree with that. I've always liked the banana candy flavor that everybody hates. Banana runs are good. I like banana, Eric. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, before we get into Tankathon, Sweet 16's tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it, Eric. Tomorrow and Friday. Luckily, my Gonzaga Bulldogs don't play until Friday. I can kind of enjoy the action before stressing about it, you know? But you'll have the Blazer game coinciding. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> oh, yeah. We play at Miami at 5. When does Gonzaga play? Because I ain't watching the Blazer game if Gonzaga's playing in Sweet 16. Like, there's there's priorities here. I might be really pissed off on that postgame show. Because they are playing Purdue. Gonzaga tips off 439 and the Blazers tip off like 510. So that game will be over. So I'll be able to do a post-game show. But I'm not watching the Blazers lose to Miami. Because now Miami will finally play their players. Against Golden State, they rested all their guys. So Golden State could get a win just so they could screw us over. Luckily, I never did say um, Houston won that game. So Houston wins. San Antonio wins. Charlotte wins. If only Golden State could have lost today, it would have been an amazing tanking day. Bulls won. Bulls won. Yeah. Hawks won. 
Hawks aren't catching the Warriors, though. Hawks suck, but, I mean, that, that win over the Boston was pretty impressive. So we'll take a look at Tankathon in a second. But first, we got to give a shout-out to our sponsor, BetUS. Favorite sportsbook and casino. Live betting and racebook. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. BetUS, where the game begins. All right, so we got Sweet 16 spreads that we're going to take a look at right here. Um, simply got to go to the left section, basketball, and we got March Madness right there. So we got eight spread lines. Me and Eric have been doing this through the tournament. It's been fun. Illinois is one and a half point underdogs against Iowa State, Eric. I love Illinois. I was second guessing them. In my bracket, I, I initially had him going to the championship, and then I switched to Auburn, which was a failure on my part. <laughs> um, so, should have kept Illinois. I think they take care of business against Iowa State, but I think this is going to be a phenomenal game. Uh, this is going to be a heavyweight fight. These are two really good teams. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll have some fun and pick Iowa State then if you're on Illinois. All right, just to go against me, he's Yeah, going let's Iowa go. State. Head to head. Connecticut. I'll tell my boy Tom Fisher. <laughs> yeah, your guy Tom. Hey, Iowa State wins by one. All right, I'm with Tom, but I'm going to Illinois. Uh, UConn, rematch of the championship. This is going to be a fun game just for that reason. UConn 11-point favorites. UConn's looked as dominant as ever this tournament, but San Diego State, like, if you're ever going to be playing with something extra in March Madness, they're going against the team that beat them in the championship. I expect them to keep it a little bit closer than this, so I'm going to take San Diego State in the points. Said it last game. I'm going to say it again. Until Connecticut does not blow a team out, I'm just going to continue to take them. So give me Connecticut minus whatever the spread is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that might be a wise bet for you guys to get in with that 125% bonus, the three that BetUS is offering you. Just keep rolling with Connecticut. I can't argue with that. I do think San Diego State is going to be as motivated as ever. Although, if you're not as motivated as ever playing in March Madness, then there might be something wrong with you. You got North Carolina four and a half point favorites against Alabama. I'm going to take North Carolina. I don't like Alabama at all. Um, that game against Grand Canyon was a lot of fun. I don't trust them. Uh, give me, give me North Carolina. Yeah, I've been down on Bama all year. Haven't given them any credit. Uh, Screw it. I, I just think they they come up with a su surprise. Someone's got to make an upset, right? So I'll take Bama. You're going against me on everything. Let's go. Let's, Let's go. go. Yeah. Fun. All right. We got Arizona Clemson. Arizona seven and a half point favorites. Um, Clemson's look good, man. Clemson's look good, and I still don't trust Arizona. I still think Arizona is can't be. They're not consistent enough to keep going on a run. I think Clemson has a legitimate chance to win this game. So I'm going to take Clemson on the points. Well, then, give, no, just, I, I like Clemson, too. <laughs> I'm not just going opposite of you. I, I do like Clemson to keep it close as well. <laughs> Bummer, huh? I was looking forward <laughs> to that. That would have been fun in, like, every game. All right, well, here we go, then. Gonzaga, five-and-a-half-point underdogs against Purdue. Gonzaga played Purdue earlier in the year, and we're in the game until, like, the final ten minutes. Gonzaga's a better team than they were then. So give me Gonzaga and five-and-a-half points. Um... Yeah, I think this is where – I'm sorry, Tori. I'm going to take Purdue. I think uh, – Hater. They're going to have trouble with the ED in this one. And, you uh, didn't see us eviscerate your boy Bill Self in the Kansas Jayhawks? Well, Kansas sucks. Your but boy Johnny oh. Furphy? Yeah. Uh, okay. We, we destroyed him so bad you uh, dropped Johnny Furphy off your big board? I did? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. But, uh, hey, Gonzaga, I think Gonzaga will keep it close. Uh, watch out. Watch All out. Right. Um, <laughs> Creighton, Tennessee. Tennessee three-point favorites. I, I'm i going to take Creighton in the points. I have Tennessee in my final four, but I don't feel good about this game for them. I feel like this could be another Creighton Elite Eight run, so give me Creighton in the points. Yeah, Creighton should not be here right now, um, but, yeah, I'd also take Creighton in the points. Marquette versus NC State. NC State is just that team that's super hot that, uh, I mean, they did get a little bit of a favor maybe in getting to face Oakland, a 14 seed in the second round, and they almost mm. lost to him as OT. 
you know, give me Marquette. They're just they're just noticeably better than NC State. Kolek is back. He's playing well. So give me them. Yeah, they might have a little bit of trouble with Burns. Um, but yeah, I agree. I'm going to take Marquette as well. And then Houston Duke. Houston almost had one of the most epic March Madness collapses in the round of 32. Their four point favorites against <clears throat> Duke. Duke dominated. Wade Taylor had like this worst game ever. Yeah. Which I thought Houston would do a good job shutting him down, but they still almost lost the game. That was phenomenal. I called that. Dang they it. came back from like down 12 with a minute and 20 seconds left and tied it going into OT. It was a fun game. Houston won. Uh, I'm going to take Houston here, though. Like, I think they're better than Duke. They've been struggling a little bit lately, and Duke just played a really good game. I just think, I don't know. I think Duke's a little soft, and Houston plays really good defensively they'll get up in you um they'll play physical i just think it's a bad matchup for duke i like houston yeah i also like houston i i want to pick duke here but i just have a feeling when you have a really good shooting game it's hard to then like duplicate mccain hitting eight threes again you know so um i just think they're gonna have a little bit tougher time against Houston than they did in the last game. And, uh, and yeah, ultimately meet their demise. Yep. Um, so, anyway, we'll see how we did. We still need to look back at pri- prior streams. But it'll be a, le- a little easier to keep track of the, uh, the Sweet 16 here. We'll see how we did. Uh, we have that stream on Friday, which is going to be during uh, some of those games. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we can talk about that a little bit then. But if you guys want to get in on any of these lines, if you want to ride the UConn dominance streak, uh, they've just been blowing teams out of the water lately. You can get in on this action. Sign up link in the description box below. Promo code JOIN125 for three 125% deposit bonuses uh, on your first three deposits up to $2,500 on BetUS, where the game begins. Shout out to them for sponsoring the post game stream i also love that graphic they got there a little something orange in the in the top left because this graphic was too too red eric too red oh you got the orange too and i got like off orange creamsicle orange so we're kind of kind of fitting the vibe here uh let's do tankathon you guys have been waiting for it let's tankathon big boards let's do it no! <laughs> gotta love the no that plays every time i load it um anyway uh portland we actually have some stuff to talk about because charlotte who did they beat tonight uh, uh cleveland sorry alex Thank you, Alex. Thanks to your Cavs for losing to Charlotte somehow. I don't know how that happened, but uh, that's phenomenal. We are tied in the loss column. They're one win away from us. We're half a game out of fourth best loss. Eric, we're two games out of third. Let's go. San Antonio, four and six. One, two in a row. We might be able to get third best odds, honestly, which is crazy. That would be phenomenal. I couldn't imagine yeah. having third best odds. Let's get it. I'm sorry. I forgot who this was in chat, so I can't give you credit. But I saw someone comment earlier. If there's one thing the Blazers know how to do, it's lose in March and April. Yep. Yep, as evident by this. And this. The last team we beat was when we played the Hawks at home. I was at that game. Eric, you know what's funny is... Is, is that like, Jonathan Ever says it was him. I'll give him credit. So in terms of Blazers' schedule, right, they beat Milwaukee. They beat Memphis twice, Toronto, then Atlanta. I was at the Milwaukee and Atlanta games. I guess if I go to games, they win, although I was at the OKC game. But they almost won that, if you remember. That was against a healthy OKC team. Mm-hmm. So they played really well that game. So I need to not go to a game for the rest of the year. Luckily, we only have three more home games that I won't be going to. So, I guess I just inspire them. You know, I, I inspire Aiton by hating, and I inspire the team by showing up in the arena and changing the aura, changing the air in that arena. So, because uh, since that game, man, L, 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 bunch of L's. 
and Miami, Orlando, that Charlotte game, Eric, I am going to be rooting so hard for a loss in that game. This game is the tanking Super Bowl for us. Yeah. Biggest game of the year. You guys thought it was when Dame returned with Milwaukee. You thought it. You, you thought this was the biggest game of the year? If you want to say that's the biggest game of the year, we got the outcome we wanted, right? Because people wanted to show Dame that we could still win games here in Portland without him. But this game, the result we need is an, is an L. So hopefully we win this tanking Super Bowl by losing to the Hornets on the third. And we set it up multiple games in advance when Anthony doesn't play that day, that it won't be weird. Yeah, exactly. So smart move by the Blazers, but we might have to come up with a little injury for Banton that we need to make up because <laughs> he's playing great. Uh, and then we got we got Washington the game after, Eric. Like Washington's been playing better, though. Yeah. The final five games of this, Houston, that game could be huge for them catching Golden State. We play Golden State. If we are gonna if we're gonna win one game the rest of the year, I hope it's Thursday, April eleventh against Golden State. This is a really interesting schedule for draft pick purposes the rest of the year. Yep. These last five games are tough though. And you got Miami, Orlando, like other than Charlotte and Washington, it's all <laughs> playoff or play in teams. It's all above five hundred teams the rest of the way. Yep. Which is a good thing for the Blazers as we try and tank our way to glory. Also, somebody really haven't talked about. So Atlanta and Chicago, even if they finish below Golden State, if they somehow make the playoffs, that yeah. would push a team with a, a better record than Golden State down to 14, and they would leapfrog them into the 15th spot. So uh, we, if they don't end up passing them in the standings, we need to root like heck for uh, hopefully Atlanta to – to win two playing games and um, move up into that 15th spot, which would bump Golden State down automatically. It'd especially be funny if it came at the expense of Miami. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, yeah, basically one of the nine or ten seeds in the East is going to be in the, the final playing game for the eighth seed. So uh, if they win that game, Golden State moves up to 12. So yeah. there is a decent chance they could move up to 12. If Houston passes Golden State, then there's a legitimate. Then they're going to be twelfth, with a legitimate chance at eleventh. Mm -hmm. So if if Houston can pass Golden State, if Golden State ends up eleventh in the West, we could have the eleventh pick there, which would be great, you know, uh, given how this looked. If that pick can move up to eleventh, um, and then maybe it's more likely Cronin fall, falls in love with the prospect. I don't even care who, just fall in love with somebody so you don't trade the pick for a freaking role player. Anyway, uh, David asked if we tie with Charlotte or someone else, however, the odds determined. So they just split it evenly between the two teams that are tied in the cases where there's like an odd number of uh, lottery numbers for those two teams. There would be a coin flip to determine who got that extra one uh, number combination. So like, let's say there's like a thousand combinations Right now, if we have a 10.2% chance of moving up, yeah. uh, we'd have 102 of those thousand or whatever um, combinations and so on. So that if we're tied with someone else, uh, it would just split that. Yeah. Basically, Charlotte has 125 combinations. We have 105. So we'd have each have 115 in this scenario, yeah. I believe, um, out of 1,000. So anyway, let's simulate this thing. Scroll up and wish for luck. Let me try and scroll it a little more smoothly. At 14 is New Orleans. At 13 is Portland via the Golden State Warriors. At 12 is OKC via Houston. At 11 is Chicago. 10 is Atlanta. We got Utah at 9. So far it's Chalky. At 8 is Houston via Brooklyn. At 7 is Memphis. It's straight chalk. Good so far. At 6 is the Charlotte Hornets, meaning the Portland Trailblazers are moved up into the top four again. Meaning we should not pass that. Right? Detroit should be next, right? Detroit should always be next, but instead, it's the San Antonio Spurs. Hmm. San Antonio. So third and fourth fall down. We got Portland, Toronto, 
It's always Toronto, Washington, and Detroit. Mm -hmm. Can we finally get a number one pick, Eric? I feel like we keep moving up into the top four and we can't get a number one pick. So hopefully, hopefully this time we can finally get a freaking number one pick. I feel like we're due. At four is... <laughs> no! No! <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Um, at three is Washington, at two is Toronto, at one is Detroit. Good for Detroit, they finally yeah, got Yeah, I'm back. happy for Detroit. But I'm sad for ourselves. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at least we moved up one spot, but, oh man, Eric, like... A, Buzelis is probably there at four, and that's who I want at four. Yeah. That's who I want at four. We got Carson in here. He's loving the soundboard. What's up, Carson? Always good to have you in here. Um, let's just uh, reveal our latest top 10. And mm -hmm. then we'll go to 11 to 20. Then we'll go to 21 to 30. We got a giant big board reveal for you today. Let's hop straight into that, Eric. Here is latest big board. So there's somebody missing that's been in your top 10, and that is Auric Chomchi, if you want to speak on him. Yeah, I just decided until he declares for the draft to remove him just to make my rankings a little cleaner there in the, at the top. Um, so I just took him off my board. I will add him back in if he uh, declares for the draft. Um, but uh, as of right now, um, it's he's going to play in the Hoop Summit on April 13th here in Portland, uh, so uh, we have a chance to go watch him in person, along with uh, Cooper Flag is uh, he'd be playing against and uh, uh, Ace Bailey. Um, I don't know how to say his name. Kamak, uh, the big seven-two center. Malawak, yeah. Ma Malawak, yeah. Uh, Something like that. Yeah. He's going to Duke next year with Flag. Uh, he is also going to be there. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's that's going to be an awesome game. I'm I'm going to try my best to make it there, um, and uh, scout Ulrich in person. Uh, but uh, yeah, they also have some sort of showcase from the African Academy that he's participating in after that. Um, so I think how he, the feedback he gets from those two events will go a long way to determining. Uh, whether or not he comes over this year or not. But until yeah. he does, I'm just going to pretend like he's going to go to college. Yeah, so I did the same thing. I also removed him from my board. Um, Matt Cardell says no Risa Shea. Is this the first time you've heard us talk about Risa Shea? No. So Eric has him at seven. I moved him down a little bit more. I'll talk about him when I get to him. But I've talked about him a ton and how I'm not high on him. Um... I like Buzelis a lot, and the more I think about Buzelis' game, the more I feel like he's being discounted a little too much by people that have him 8th, ninth, 10th. He's a 6'10 forward. He was a good shooter before this past year. He struggled with the NBA three-point line in the G League, shooting the three ball, right? But he was known as a shooter coming into the G League at night, and... I believe in his creation upside. I believe in his ability to handle the ball, to read defense, to um, do things with his life dribble. And I think it's it's easier to bet on him becoming a shooter with that creation ability than it is betting on a guy like Zachary Rishache to become a creator with his shooting ability. Right. I think it's much safer to bet on Buzelis becoming a shooter. I don't trust... I guess I'll talk about Risha Shea a little bit now. I don't trust Risha Shea's upside at all as a creator. I just don't think he's going to be somebody that's going to do a whole lot off the dribble. I think with his size and skill, and he's like uh, fluid, I guess. At, like he can, he's coordinated. He'll be able to do things here or there off the dribble, maybe attack gaps or whatever. But I don't, I don't think Risha Shea's ever going to be a guy where you put the ball in his hands and he's going to go make a play. He's going to create at the end of a shot clock. He's going to take over a game. That's why I don't have Risa Shea as high as consensus. Uh, I am lower on Risa Shea for those reasons. 
And I like some of these prospects in this top 10 more than consensus, I guess. And that's why I've bumped Risa Shea down my board. Um, Tyler James says, Tori, you kind of weren't super high on him not long ago. I thought in terms of Matos, I just stopped overthinking him because as a shooter, he comes in, he doesn't shoot the ball super well. And the game I watched, he was just kind of like disappeared and he is prone to maybe disappearing for stretches. But at the end of the day, at the top of the draft, they're swinging for upside. And he certainly has arguably, the, in my opinion, the second highest upside out of anyone in this draft class. I think Sar has the most. Um, and he has some things that you could put stock in him having a decent chance to reach that upside. And that is the way he can handle the ball, the way he can move off the dribble. So that's why I moved him up to number two. Yeah, um, in case you missed it too, uh, I might not you, but chat. Uh, so Matas called out Risha Shea in a recent interview, said that he would absolutely work out against him for NBA teams and wants to play him one on one to show that he's a better player than him. Uh, I like that. I yeah, like that. I, that alone, that kind of mindset in an era where more often than not, these guys will refuse to work out with any other players or against anyone that's good or whatever. Um, that kind of attitude, I think, goes a long way in showing me what type of um, person and, and competitor someone is. Um, and I think it killed him being on such an insanely crappy team this year. And uh, yeah. Um, I, I just thought that was cool of him. And so, uh, yeah, I've been kind of teetering on him as well. Um, but, um, yeah. He certainly has some question marks, but, I mean, everybody in this draft class has question marks. At the end of the day, you're drafting in the top. I'd rather swing on greater upside than Zachary Risa At a certain point, like, hypothetically, if the Warriors moved up to four, and we're still trying to compete with that core, like, Risa Shea would be a pretty solid pick for them. I think he would fit in really, really well. And if it's a team trying to win that needs a piece Memphis. right away, right? Memphis is another team where in the top 10, I don't hate Risa Shea as a pick, as a pick for Memphis. A lot of this is context-dependent based on teams. My big board, I feel like, is just an average out of everything, and in terms of the top 10, most teams in the top 10 should, in my opinion, be swinging for upside. Therefore, my top 10 is mostly based on prospects that I feel have a certain level of upside. And then as we get later on to my big board, then it's a mix, right? Um, because you get more teams that are looking for win now players, but you still get teams that are looking for upside, just like the Blazers should be doing with the Golden State Warriors pick, even if it's in the late teens, if they play their way into the playoffs and go on a run here. So... That's the way I view my big board. Um, nothing else changed too much. I dropped Reed Shepard down a little bit. I go back and forth on him, but he could be the the best shooter in the league someday. And in a draft class like this, it's mm -hmm. it's tough for me to move him much lower than that. Um, yeah, is there any other prospects here you want to talk about? Uh, well, Taylor says, do you just believe in his creation more than Tori or do you value his shooting more? Just curious why it's higher for you. I'm assuming you're talking about Risha, Risha Uh I, I do like his size. I think he showed me some things on defense um, that I think make him maybe at least a neutral to above, slightly above average defender possibly. Um, I just, I like taking a chance on a guy with that size and potential shooting if he can be a little more consistent with it. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, obviously I'm still at seven is lower than consensus as well on him. So um, it's not like I'm, like, super high on him because I, I, I have him lower than consensus too, just not as far down as Tori does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Castle... I he's struggled a little bit to shoot recently. I still just like his tools and his feel. Um, Collier, me and Eric both a little higher than him on consensus. I bumped Salon up two spots just because, like he is. An there you go, Tori. Good job. <laughs> he's he's just such a 
he's he's just so raw man like it's it's tough it's tough he could be a steal like i would rather the blazers i was just thinking about it in terms of the blazers and i would probably rather have the blazers take him than Risa Shea. Yeah. so um a lot of teams <laughs> in the top 10 are probably going to be in the same mode as the blazers mm-hmm. so but they're going to value Risa Shea more it sounds like teams love Risa Shea apparently um so you know, that's just kind of how I viewed it. Like, Dalton Connect, I'm not any lower on him, but he's a little lower upside than the guys above him. A little bit more NBA ready as well, being an older prospect. So that's why he's lost in at 10. Yeah. Um, this draft is very difficult with that. Like, I, whenever I'm, you know, thinking about changing my big board, I'm always like, how much do I, should I factor in age? Because... Like, certain players we'll get to that are older that I think would be perfect for winning teams, but, like, rebuilding teams shouldn't touch them. Uh, so it's hard to, like, know where to put them on draft boards. Yeah. Uh, anyway, like, me and Eric are both lower on Topic. Eric has Topic at 10. I'll reveal the next slide. I have Topic at 12. Um, Risa Shea 11, Topic 12. Not much has changed for the rest of that. Not much has changed for you either. So I guess feel free to ask us questions about any prospects on this slide. I guess we'll talk about the new guys uh, to our top 20. I'll start with mine. I think Ty, I think Tyon Grant Foster is going to be a good good NBA player. Mm-hmm. I think he's going to be good. He's 24 years of years of age. He had a scare where he collapsed at halftime of the first game a couple years ago when he was playing for DePaul, had a medical scare, um, got cleared from it. Like, he basically missed two seasons, got cleared from it this past season, and dominated for Grand Canyon, who uh, made it to the round of 32, was in a competitive game against Alabama. He just has a phenomenal first step, Eric, for a guy that's – he looks like a legit 6'7". That's what he's listed at. He looks like a legit 6'7". He can handle the ball. He can uh, – you know, has shown flashes of hitting threes off the dribble. He shot 33%. That's something that has to improve a little bit more, but it's close enough where he's strong, he's shifty, he drives hard, he has a very quick first step. I just think he's going to be able to get buckets um, at a small forward position at 6'7". Uh, so I really like his game. And it's tough because he is 24, but I do think he has a little bit of upside that archetype does. And maybe he's going to be slept on a little bit too much because of his age in a draft with no sure things beyond the lottery. I mean, even in the lottery. So uh, I really like him. Yeah. I, outside of obviously the last two games, I just don't feel confident enough in just those two games. So want to do a little deeper dive before I put him like in a first round scenario. Also, he's not on, he's still not on Fanspo. I know you told me to write him in, but uh, yeah, I just didn't, didn't uh, bother with that yet. But yeah, definitely someone that could help a a winning team. And I just, I do like those kind of guys who have the ability to take over games and uh that's something that you can't teach like they they shine in big moments and things like that and even if like tommy says this is his first year shooting well um he did put a team on his back and and uh should have maybe carried him to the sweet 16 but um yeah I, i i like players like that so i don't mind you putting them up that high yeah it's one of those things where he has a lot of tools beyond just shooting and he only shot 33 percent from three right so that is a question mark but you can develop shooting more so than you can develop the first step that he has right if you could develop his first step i would love to take chris murray and give chris murray grant foster's first step you know what i mean like he in, in playing against alabama was what i was looking forward to as well um he's just big and strong and quick like moves well can decelerate well like a lot of those movement pattern things with the ball handling with a six foot seven i think he's a legit six seven wing is very intriguing to me and that archetype is the type that i like 
Uh, so I, I'm definitely ranking him here. And there's, there's a couple of draft guys that also have him first round. I don't really care about consensus, but there's a couple guys I really pay attention to. One is Raphael Barlow. He said he has a first round grade on him. Um, I tweeted out something about having a first round grade on uh, Grant Foster and Hoop Intellect liked the tweet. So, um, you know, he's the guy that puts together really good scouting videos. And I don't know where he's going to have him on his latest big board. Uh, I know he had him late second on his last one. I think he's going to bump him up. I'm not sure where. But, you know, it's 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 kind of where I think consensus will trend more towards him being a, a late first round pick. And we're just early on it right now. What is that noise? What noise? I'm playing with my headphones. Maybe that was it. No. It's outside here. Outside of your house? I don't know if that's thunder or... Is an earthquake? Uh... It's like... It's like, it's like a loud rumbling noise. Lightning <laughs> radar. I'll look up a lightning <laughs> radar. I know we, we had thunder here earlier. Yeah, okay, there's no thunder where I'm at. But... <clears throat> um. Anyways, uh, sorry. What, what were you saying? Did you ask me something? Um. Oh, yeah. I was just saying, like, that's the archetype I like. Movement uh, patterns, yeah. you know, like, just, yeah. just, oh, mm-hmm. oh, I was saying, like, Raphael Barlow has a, yeah, yeah, I heard has, that part. all that stuff. Like, basically, my point is with them is, like, I think we're, I think consensus will trend towards him being a late first round pick and a guy that could climb up to 19, kind of like Pajemski, you know, Pajemski at this time last year was a second round pick and then climbed his way all the way up to 19, ironically, here. But I think we're just Hawkins early. Too. Yeah, Hawk is. Like, I think we're just early in terms of, like, I think at least me, I'm early in terms of having a first-round grade on him. I think consensus will trend towards that. Yeah. Uh, For me, uh, so obviously Reed Shepard 11 is probably popping out at a lot of people. I I like Reed Shepard. I just, the top 10 I like more than him. Um, But I do... I don't know if I think he might be a little bit of a tweener. Um, And I mean, combo guards can succeed in the NBA. So I don't think that's an issue or anything, but I don't know if he's as dynamic enough with the ball to be a point guard. And I don't know if he's big enough to be a shooting guard. So he might be kind of stuck in that little, a little bit of a range where he, I don't know. I, I just, I still really like him a lot. It's just I like the top 10 more. Yeah, I'm shying less and less away from that archetype given the talent, offensive talent that is coming in at yeah. front court spots because then you can play a guy like him at the point guard spot, but he doesn't have to handle all the point guard duties, right? And mm-hmm. I mean, really, in today's day and age, like what really is a point guard? You just need somebody yeah. to bring the ball up the court and then you can initiate offense. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, it's going to end up in your best player's hands anyway, and he's going to be a guy that is going to be a great fit next to better players as such a phenomenal shooter and i think when you can shoot that well too it makes it less of a problem um because teams teams aren't gonna leave him um and you know if 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 he's he he probably is never going to be the best player on a playoff team Mm -hmm. but i think he could be maybe the third like a really good third option yeah. As a guy that can score a little bit with the ball in his hands, but then play off of your number one and your number two and be a phenomenal floor spacer and just make teams pay for a split second lapse where they forget about him. Um, and then, you know, he's averaging four or five assists a game, so I think he yeah. can be a bit of a secondary playmaker. So that's mm-hmm. that's where I have him a little higher. I mean, this didn't affect my range, obviously, because he was right here uh, on my last board. But um, I don't know. You just see some of those guys – like him in the tournament kind of uh, just wither in that, those key moments down the stretch of a game. Throw, he threw a couple of bad passes, and um, it, like I said, it didn't really affect my stock on him, but um, just 
it's hard to judge a freshman, you know, at first yeah. tournament and all that kind of stuff versus 24 year olds like Tyon Grant Foster, you know, like it's so I'm trying to weigh all these things together. But well, my the, thing is, is Calipari Kentucky guards always do that. Yeah. And then they always right. come into the NBA and they're great. You know For what I sure. mean? They always play better in the NBA than under there's Calipari. Just, so there's just so many of them this year. I know, which this is going to be a phenomenal case to either make or break that case. Yeah. Yeah. Like, are they all good or is it selective? Yeah. So this is a phenomenal year just to find that out. And then down there at the end of my uh, teens to 20, 18, 19, 20, um, I saw Taylor ask me why I'm higher than consistent on Justin Edwards now. I We talked about this uh, last time, but um, I just feel like it's a bit of a... I don't know if you can hear that, but it's no. like so loud outside. Um, the uh, I feel like he was like a top five pick, and then people just like dropped him way into the second round, and he was like became an afterthought. And I think he's somewhere in between those two. Um, he did show me a lot defensively, and then with Salas, McCain, and Edwards, it's shooting, man. Uh, I I just I I'm really valuing. Uh, players who can space the floor and knock down that three and just be a serious threat that you have to account for on offense. And I think all three of those guys fit that mold uh, regardless of size. So um, none of them have the ball handling that Reed Shepard has. That's why Shepard's so much higher than the three of them. But um, I I think uh, uh, I just, I like all three of their ability to shoot the ball and uh, Justin Edwards, obviously being the biggest of the three um, and playing more of a premium position at the wing. um, It's it's hard for me not to have him any lower than this. Yeah. Um, Shepard, the ball handling. Also, I think defensively he can compare to McCain. Salas might be a better defender than both. Um, Salas is really good defensively, but, I mean, the thing is, is both those guys were really, really good shooters uh, this past season, and Reed Shepard was still noticeably better as a shooter. That's how good Reed Shepard was. 52% from behind the arc is absolutely insane. (laughs) So um, that's why Shepard is definitely higher than them. McCain is more of a tweener because I don't think he can handle the ball and create for others anywhere near as well as Reed Shepard can. Um, and he's 6'3", maybe NBA measurements, 6'2". Uh, so that's where, on a team like Orlando, he'd be great. You got bigger playmakers. But on a team that needed like a legitimate point guard ball handler, um, you probably would view him as a bench shooter in that on that type of team, kind of like a Seth Curry role like Seth Curry had behind Damon CJ back when he played for Portland. But I do like McCain. I, uh, I bumped Klingon up. He's been playing better. I don't think he has much upside beyond being a role player, but I think he's going to be a role player just because he's going to be a good enough rim protector and um, do have a little bit worry, a little bit of concern in terms of his foot speed and if teams can make him defend in space, can they take advantage of him? But I do think he's big enough where he can give gaps and still bother shots and be a, a really good drop big man. Uh, I don't know how well he's going to be executing other types of schemes, but uh, I do have him at 18. And then that's a good segue, Eric, because you have him at uh, 21. So, yeah. And I have McCain at 21. So, a couple of guys we've kind of added to our top 20 ish, mm-hmm. clinging to McCain. Um, I like McCain for his shooting. He can get hot in a hurry defensively, competes at least. Um, so I think, you know, if he's forced to play the two next to a, a small one, does he work? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if he can defend the two at the NBA level, but I think he can definitely defend the point guard spot. Um, but do you have any thoughts on Klingon? Yeah, I mean, same thing we've said about him all along, in my opinion. I He's skilled. Um very, very useful in college where you can camp in the paint. Um, how well will he do getting hunted on pick and rolls? Same problem I have with Zach Eady. Um, it's just, it's tough to envision him 
being okay on the perimeter. Um, but I mean, if the rules change, obviously, um, it, it will change things. But um, in terms of of him, man, I like I, I think he's a decent enough passer. Um, I just I don't think a lot of his post moves will work that well in the NBA uh, against NBA big big men. But um, yeah, so I, I think he'll be fine, uh, especially rim protection if he's not um, drawn out of the paint too often. But, um, yeah, um, just real solid center. I think if, if you get him in the in this range of 21 where I have him, I think you're getting a steal at that pick. Yeah, depends on team um, for sure. Should be probably to a winning team mm. uh, that needs center help. Like, he would make a lot of sense in maybe Golden State to help out their defense as a guy that can contribute right away. Um so I basically all these players on this scene I've had other than Tristan Da Silva I have coming in at 30 I think he's one slot ahead of Johnny Furphy I I like I like Da Silva as a guy that's NBA ready that I feel like has a higher floor than Furphy Mm -hmm. and I'm not super bullish on Furphy's upside which is why I put Da Silva one spot ahead because Da Silva can pass the ball a little bit, can shoot the ball a little bit. He's just very solid, and I think he'll be a good bench piece that um, can maybe be a little like Chris Murray-ish in a way, but you can have more faith in his shot um, because he'll make the smart play. Defensively, I don't know if he's quite going to be quite as good as Chris Murray. You know, like I think he's maybe a little bit worse, but I think he's somebody that can just be well-rounded and space the floor and – playing the flow of an offense and make the right pass. So uh, he was impressive down the stretch of the season for Colorado as well. Yeah, I like the Silva. I have him just outside in my first round. Yeah, so you have uh, Tristan Newton at 24. Yes, that's who I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, this this is my new guy, Tori. Um, and uh, I know he's probably not going to go in the first round. Um and, uh, yeah, but I mean, if you get this guy in the second round, um, he's a little bit older too. This is where I said, I, I struggle with the, um, the age stuff, you know? Yeah. Uh, but okay. So not the greatest shooter is shooting. So like 32% yep. this year from three. Um, and his age is an issue. But outside of that, this dude just makes winning plays. He does everything. He's a good defender. He passes the ball well. He's 6'4", 6'5", and can handle the ball like a point guard, uh, run the offense, um, gets to the free throw line a decent amount. His free throw rate is really good. Um, he rebounds really well for a guard. Uh like, like this, you look at the box score of every game, and it's just like he just puts up monster numbers. And uh, and I think players like him that just know how to play the game the right way, and I think it's a major contribution to what UConn's done the last two years. And if you're sitting there in the 20s, you're obviously, unless you traded for the pick, um, you're a good team. And I think... Uh, much like your love for uh, Andre Jackson last year, um, I just think Tristan Newton is a kind of glue do it all type of player uh, that I think will thrive at any level or any like type of competition. So I think he'll he'll make a pretty easy transition into the NBA. Yeah, I dude. I don't know what to think of him because I have watched him watch a lot of UConn this year, obviously with them being dominant, them having Stefan Castle. And there's times where he looks really, really good. And then there's times where he just can't make a shot. Um, and if he, if he can shoot the three ball a little better, I would definitely have him in my first round. Um, 
I don't really see him on any draft boards. It's weird. Yeah, I've seen him in second rounds. It'll be interesting to see what he measures. I think he has the question of like what exactly is his role if he struggles to shoot the three, but he can definitely play. Yeah, I don't really know. He had a game earlier this season, 10 points, 16 rebounds, 10 assists. So he rebounds the ball well, passes the ball well. I don't know how I feel about him, so. Yeah. I do I do see why somebody would have him where you have him, though. Um, because when he's on, when he's hitting shots, he's really impressive. Yeah. And he's part of that, why that team is so good. Mm-hmm. So. I'll definitely look into him a little bit more. You might be able to convince me to put him in my first round. But the thing is, like, the players I have in this range, like, I don't hate Furphy that much. I like a lot of players in this range. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I have I have Filipowski 27. I don't like where Filipowski is projected, which is late lotto. I think that's way too high. But at this point in the draft, I do understand taking a chance on what he can do. Mm-hmm. Um... I got Jerron Holmes here. I've liked Jameer Watkins for a while. Visage, I think, has you know a level of upside. I go back and forth on where exactly to slot him in, given that yeah. he wasn't given a chance to prove much at Kentucky. Um, I like uh, the more I like right now. I feel like maybe I should put a Visage up the board. There's just players in front of him that I like. I like Justin Edwards for some of the reasons you said. I like Jerron Holmes. The one thing that concerns me about Jerron Holmes is. Um, if he's too, I feel like he might actually be a little too undersized at the center spot in the NBA. Uh, I know we had this conversation earlier and I said, I wasn't really concerned about that, but, uh, watching some of the tape, just him on the boards and getting out muscled a little bit is a bit of a concern for me. Um, against some of the, the bigger teams that he's played this year in the what do they play the american or is it the atlantic 10 it's the atlantic 10 huh um that conference isn't super big that's the conference with vcu duquesne um right temple uh yeah yeah i mix up the american and the atlantic 10 all the time but he's skilled i just want those skills at a center spot Mm. with with him um, Kalel Ware, Boder, but he's talented and a legitimate seven feet tall. So a lot of prospects in this range. That's why I say like people can't just say the draft sucks through and through because I think you're getting good return on value in this range with these picks. Like I think a number of these players could be very solid NBA contributors. And, you know, I have Furphy down into the second round. I think he could be a solid NBA contributor as a shooter. The problem I have with Furphy, Eric, is just I don't – by his creation at all the thing is though and this is something that i was thinking about when i didn't have furphy in my top 30 what is truly the difference between risa shea and furphy where they should be oh. this far apart on my big board yeah, I think Risha Shea is a little, I don't know, he just seems a little bigger, which is important when you're talking about. I don't want to have a I mean, pause here's moment. The thing, here's but, the thing, though. Furphy is listed as 6'9". Yeah, Risha Shea is... He's not 6'9". <laughs> There's no way. I don't know. Like, if they come out with equal measurements, yeah, should they not be close together on a big board? Uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe. That's that's the thing that I'm struggling with. Is like, if Furphy was consensus top three right now and Risa Shea was where Furphy is, I would probably have them closer, which is like, okay, that means that consensus is affecting my big board, which I'm trying for it not to. But this is the type of stuff I think about when I'm trying not to be affected by consensus. Like, what is the huge difference between them? Like, I think well, Risa Shea is a little, a little bit better, mm-hmm. but they're kind of similar. Mean, Furphy was not as highly thought of coming to the season and hasn't had as many 
I mean, he had that stretch uh, a couple months ago where he went from being not even on draft radars to, you know, kind of like your Ty and Grant Foster, um, you know, jumping up there into the first round. Um, but he kind of fell off again. That So it's like, I don't know, with Furphy, it's a little bit of a small sample size where Richeche has been a little bit um, better. And then also, uh, also I think, um, I don't know, I, I'm i still kind of questioning Furphy's defense if, if it could be that good. Yeah. Um, Risa Shea shot the ball better this year than Furphy. Furphy's shooting kind of regressed at the end of the year a little bit, fell down to 35%. Yeah. So you can make the case that Risa Shea is a noticeably better shooter. And the stats do back that up. But free throw percentage is something that you can use to project NBA three-point shooting. Furphy shot 76%. Risa Shea only shot 69%, and Risa Shea wasn't known as a lights-out shooter before this past year. Yeah. So I could see a world where those guys are very similar as NBA three-point shooters mm-hmm. and have similar size and really aren't all that much different. I think Risa Shea is the better prospect, but when we're talking about Risa Shea consensus top three player and Furphy, like, consensus you know 15 to 25 should the gap really be that big and that's where drafting Risa Shea top three I don't like that because I feel like you can get maybe a little lesser version but someone similar much later in the draft with a guy like Johnny Furphy and I'd rather take a chance on prospects with a combination of tools that you can't find later on in the draft Mm mm-hmm yeah. I don't know. If you watch him play, I just it just seems like I mean it's kind of a cop out answer, but it seems like Richie is just has a better chance of being a better overall player if they both reach close to their their ceilings, but um but I can definitely see what you're saying. Yeah. So that's the thing I struggle with with Risa Shea with Furby. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, you mentioned free throw shooting. I just want to say one other thing. Um, So Newton is a career 83% free throw shooter too. So maybe maybe he's a better shooter than that too. I I will say I like using that more with younger prospects. Yeah, right. Compared to guys that like have a five-year sample size of struggling to shoot the three ball well Mm -hmm. in college. Um but I mean, if Newton can shoot, he's a he's probably a first round prospect. So if you have faith in him being able to shoot the three ball well enough, I fully understand and agree with having a first round grade on him. I, I just I don't know if I have faith in it. I mean, I I'm hopeful he can shoot better than he's shot. But I think when you get to the free throw line and can s- still put up a decent amount of points on decent efficiency. That's not great efficiency, but it's it's okay. Um, I I feel like you can still find ways to contribute, whereas some people it's like completely dependent on <laughs> if they can hit a three or not. Like Chris Murray, right? <laughs> like like we, we're we're only talking about him positively if he starts hitting a three, you yeah. know, in the next couple of years. So um, yeah, whereas Newton I think can impact the game in so many other ways. Yeah, so these are the conversations we have to have over the next uh, two and a half months. Mm-hmm. Well, three months. Draft is in three months, basically. Lottery's in like one and a half months. Yeah. I hate this draft after like 45. But at the <laughs> same time, there's so many but, players after 45 that are going to go higher than 45. So like a lot of these guys, like Tristan Newton, for example, might be like the 50th pick or whatever and so like that's great value there you know well how much of it is like guys that you still maybe need to scout more because i know (laughs) how much of however you say his name dotty it pakom dotty it however i probably butchered his name but how much of him have you seen well i need to i need to go back in because um there was one of the uh 
what is it draft ceilings or what what is that called no, no ceilings, ceilings. Yeah. yeah one of those guys said that he he asked the question like what on your boards what guys are a lot closer uh than the consensus is on them or something and so you would say like Furphy and Richeche, right? Yeah. That's exactly what you were talking about. Yeah. And he said uh Fadet and uh Salon. And I was like, get the brick out of here, dude. Like so I did yeah, I need to look that. back into him, but um so I I noticed him like on draft boards mm-hmm. um a few months ago or whatever, or this is heading into the season. And I watched a bunch of videos on him and stuff, and I just I did not see it with him. Like I did not really get it. So I kind of followed his season from the peripheral, but I was not really super high on him, other than like a second round flyer type guy that you could have an international stash on. Yeah. But um, I'm not set in stone on that yet. I feel like there's multiple guys past 45 that have a chance. Mm. I feel like it's it doesn't really fall off there, and I, there's just I a lot of guys it, I don't really like that much. But yeah, but like Coleman Hawkins in that range gets interesting because I see something talking about the Coleman Hawkins no. hate is Olympic. That's Tyler man. He's a... Do you do you not like Coleman Hawkins at all? I, I mean, he's okay. I, he, I just, yeah. He's he's like legit six nine. Can handle the ball a little bit. Can pass a little bit. Mm-hmm. Shot the ball. I think. Let me pull up his stats. Shot the ball decently this year. Thirty eight percent, eighty percent from the free throw line. Um, has some really impressive moments attacking off the dribble. The problem is he's way too inconsistent for a guy that's 22. Um, and he gets a bit erratic. This year, he improved that, though. He only averaged 1.6 turnovers a game. Mm-hmm. Like, averaged over a block, one and a half steals. Right? That type of prospect is interesting past 45. Like, I would absolutely take a flyer on him past 45. I'd maybe even take a flyer on him before 45. Um, So, like, a guy like him, um, a guy I'd take a flyer on Trenton Flowers past 45. He'd be an interesting guy to take a flyer on. Um, If you really want a shooter, like Peyton Samfort, I think will be a fringe rotation shooter. Um, As a guy that's 6'7 and shoots a really good three ball and shoots over 90 percent from the free throw line and averaged almost three assists a game like that's a guy that should be able to give himself a chance at being a role player in the league um there's guys there's guys there that i i feel like there will be a couple of guys past 45 that end up being solid role players in the league for sure i know terrence shannon probably makes this a little I don't know like he scores so much that maybe this is a little unfair to Coleman Hawkins but I feel like everything you said about him and his size his age his abilities shoots 38% from three which is is pretty good like why like I I look at his game logs and stuff and, and watch him play. And he doesn't do much. He doesn't take over games. He doesn't like well, it score that much. Watch. Well, I know, I know, but I'm saying like, he just like, to me, he should be dominating college right now this year. And I don't feel like he's gotten any better really since uh, like two years ago. Like I, I feel yeah. like he's just kind of, well, that's why he's okay. Not like, and if he's, yeah, I feel like he's only good because of his size. Like he, he has, he doesn't really use it well, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean that's why he's not a first round prospect. But I do think that combination of traits at that size is something intriguing when you're just taking flyers past forty five. 
Right. Like, I wouldn't view him as somebody that's not intriguing at that range. Like, I think he's intriguing at that range. Because you have multiple skills in a 6'9 forward that normally you wouldn't find in a player in that range. Mm -hmm. And he's the type of guy where, like, five years down the line, if he's... I could see him being a really good role player and looking back, like, looking back at his uh, game coming into the draft and being like, man, why was he somebody that was projected below 45 given this combination of traits that he had yeah. like that combination of traits like should have gone much higher in a weak draft so that's where um i think he's intriguing at that range because i think there is a decent chance that he could give you positive return on investment whereas other guys you know i'm not super yeah. enamored by i get it like his physical tools are intriguing yeah um like like i'd rather have him than a pj hall type for sure yeah yeah but um you know kj simpson impressive lately uh we didn't have almanza on our boards like maybe at that range you know like i I think it's i think it's i think it's deep there's still some guys that i haven't looked at but i feel like as i dive into more tape like i'll i'll be happy with the entirety of the second round yeah but i kind of always am i feel but like, a lot of those so guys go out is... higher than 45 on your board though is what i'm saying right? yeah 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 um because i love my top 45 is and then but like the last 15 is like i'm just like yeah i think there's gonna be multiple guys in your last 15 that you're uh, about that i like yeah maybe who are you the most uh, about that's on my top 30 uh, you probably have to put it back up. I assume it's somebody 21 to 30, unless it's, uh, Tyon Grant Foster. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really have a problem with your top 30. Yeah. I was just wondering who your least favorite out of all of them is. I... Go back to your team one. I, uh, I'm not as high on you on Jalen Tyson. Yeah, you don't have him top 30. I have him just outside my third. Past you. Yeah. I mean, he's fine. I just, yeah. He's not your least favorite player in my top 30, though, right? Probably not least favorite. I'm just saying someone that, like, he's one of the only ones that I wouldn't. I mean, his French first round grade for me. I don't, I think it's pretty close, but. I'd... Not lottery, lottery, but you're, you're pretty high on him. So. I mean, he basically was like a point forward for them this year without much talent without much spacing and it's shifty and can pass yeah. and make reads like that's what i look for so i uh you know he, he needs to measure big enough to play the three i think to return lottery value like late lottery value but um he just looks looks good with the ball in his hands and then can shoot a can shoot the three so yeah i could see him you know defensively maybe he has a couple questions but he has an NBA body, um, so maybe he's an off the ball guy where the ball handling doesn't translate, and he's just kind of simple, a more simplistic version of what he is in college. But I just like the upside of what he can do with the ball in his hands. For sure. Um, so that's why he's my guy. But uh, Jameer Watkins, where do you have him? Uh, I think somewhere in the thirties. Yeah. Yeah, because right now I'm... my. My second round sleepers, although Jalen Tyson has like rose a little bit, my my non consensus first round guys that I have as sleepers are Jalen Tyson, Jameer Watkins, Ty and Grant Foster. Mm -hmm. Those are my three guys right now. I yeah, measurements are gonna play a key role here. Yep, one hundred percent. Can't wait to see him. Gonna be fun. Man, I don't know what to do about Terrence Shannon. I just, I'm just gonna keep him off my board. Yeah, he's so good though. Frick. 
If without the allegations at this point, Eric, I would probably have a late lottery grade on him. Yeah. I yeah. <laughs> yeah. He just plays so powerful. Um He plays like an NBA player playing against college kids. <laughs> see, like they're not they have differences, but Terrence Shannon is almost going to be 24 when he, uh, on right. draft night. And mm. the way he drives is kind of similar to Grant Foster. Yeah. The power, the first step, how strong they, they take the ball to the rim, some of the ball handling mm. ability. Uh, Terrence Shannon, I think, is a little better shooter. And I think he's just... A little, a little more quicker. smoother. Just a yeah. Little, yeah, just a little better. Yeah. And but, he, he's doing it against he's doing it against like Big Ten teams consistently. I mean, so Shannon uh doesn't he have he still has a rape trial coming up in May or something? Yeah. yeah. I mean he he could he could be a fringe star level scorer. He averages almost nine free throw attempts a game. Yeah. Like, he, he's going to be able to get to the line in the NBA. Um, Set. What game was that that he had, like, 30-something? Was that in the Big Ten tournament? And he just freaking took over the game and dominated. Yeah. Like, he just looked like a man amongst boys out there. But He had 40 against Nebraska. Yeah, I think that was it. 11 yeah. for 22, 5 for 9 from 3, 13 for 6 and from the free throw line. Then he went in the championship 8 for 15 against Wisconsin. Had 34 points on 15 shots because he's 15 for 17. In the free throw line. And um Yeah. That dude lives at the line. Lives at the free throw line. Um So we'll see what his legal thing is. I don't know, man. So I just keep him off my board for that reason. Yeah. I just have him down there at the end. Yeah. Like in the eighties just to, with yeah. Chomchi, because I searched Chomchi. Um, well, I put Chomps in there just so I didn't like, forget to put him back on eventually, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, this draft is interesting, man. That's our updated big board, so we probably won't do it again until maybe the end of the season. And then, um, well, I'll probably do it a couple more times before the draft combine, before the lottery. And we'll start doing mock drafts in the off season, and that should be fun. Yeah. Anything else for the stream that you want to touch upon? No, thanks everyone for watching. We'll have uh, Blazers of Fries live tomorrow afternoon and then a uh, post game show after the game on Friday against the Miami Heat. Yep, looking forward to it. Uh, appreciate you guys hanging out with us. Appreciate BetUS for sponsoring the post game stream. Remember, if you want to get in on Sweet 16 action tomorrow, spread lines, um, money lines, over unders, whatever you want, make sure you use BetUS. Sign up link in the description box below. Promo code JOIN125 for three deposit bonuses of 125%. It helps out the channel. Uh, so shout out to them for sponsoring the post-game stream. Looking forward to college basketball tomorrow as the Sweet 16 is underway. And looking forward to seeing if my picks are better than yours. Yeah. Because I, I can't pick NBA games lately, Eric. So I might as well try college. Yeah. Because NBA has been a little rough. Anyway. Thank you guys All for right. hanging out with us. Appreciate y'all. We'll catch you on the next stream, which is tomorrow. Because we get to pick more games. How many games do we have tomorrow, Eric? I do not know. I have not looked that up. I will look it up right now. Tomorrow, there is... <laughs> is there any point to do this? we got two games tomorrow. Oh, okay. I don't know. I'd be fine with skipping it. March Madness. When does March Madness start? I mean, I'm down to uh, just before the first game's at 4.09. So 3.30 to 4.09. I guess this is our stream tomorrow. Picks against the spread. Uh, maybe we can just take questions on tomorrow's Blazers Up Res Live. Because, uh, you know, we always like to interact with you guys. And I feel like on a lot of streams lately, we maybe haven't been as inter interactive as we normally are. So mm -hmm. if you guys want to ask us questions... Tune into our second channel. Link in the description for that. And uh, join us tomorrow approximately 3.30 to 3.45. Going live sometime between then for Blazers Uprise Live. And with that being said, we're out of here. We will catch you in the 
next one. Until then, as always, peace out. Go Blazers.